keep your change. Yeah, honey, keep your change. Yeah, honey, keep your change. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Ari Shafir's Skeptic Tank. I'm Ari Shafir. Why doesn't the president have a podcast? <laughs> if you could just do it. I mean, you could only do it once you've already been reelected, obviously. You couldn't do it when you still have anything left to prove. But why not just go for it? I mean, you'll get some angry bloggers, but who gives a shit really, right? You're in. Dude, if I could be president, a lot of guys wouldn't want the responsibility. I wouldn't either, but I wouldn't rise to the occasion. I'd be a four and out guy. I'd be a four and out guy. I would do nothing to deserve re-election. I'd still run again. I'd still run again. But my heart wouldn't be in it. No, you know what? Maybe I just wouldn't run again. Nobody's done that, have they? Has anyone just not run again? Probably somebody in those fucking uh, dual era presidents. You know? The kind that where you could just like go in and be like, hey, president. President Hamilton or some other white name. Uh, I got a bone to pick with you. And, and Hamilton or whoever be like, well, what? Who, who are you? Like, my name's Ari. Where are you from? I'm from Tennessee. All right, Ari from Tennessee. What do you want to say? Uh, the streets aren't being cobbled correctly. It's bullshit. Uh, well, Ari, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. Who's, who's, your, who's, your, uh, who's your congressman? You know, something Smith the third. Well, I'll talk to him. We'll get that figured out. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, I mean, you know, I lost, a, lost one of those uh, wood tires the other day. These decobbled streets. No, again, I, I'm going to tell you. That, that's not right. We'll look into it. Thanks for coming in. Let's, let's get a drawing together. Where was I going with this? Oh, why well, the president should start a podcast. Yeah. Um, it's been a tough year, you guys. It really has. We lost a lot of people. Willy Wonka. Prince, Ziggy Stardust, who else? Alan Thicke, one of my TV dads. It's been tough. Obviously, the election was hard on a lot of people. Turned brother against brother. People lost a lot of Facebook friends, you guys. It's serial. People lost a lot of Facebook friends. But in these tough times, it's important to remember the good things. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. You got to step back. You got to look at the good things once in a while. You know, otherwise, everyone will commit suicide. You can't have that. You got to look at occasional good moments. The Los Angeles Lakers are 11 and 20, everybody. 11 wins for 20 losses. They're 1 and 9 in the last 10 games. Some things are good, you guys. Plus, right now, they wouldn't get a draft pick unless they finish in the top three. Unless they hit the lottery, they're not going to get a draft pick this year. Philly's getting that. So it looks like they're going to get worse as a team. You just, you just, it's important to step back and see these things and realize life ain't that bad. Hashtag fuck the Lakers. Uh, on today's episode, I have my friend Tim Dillon came in. Tim is a, a very funny young comic in, in New York. He uh, is a Long Island guy. Um, conservative a little bit, but he has his history of, uh, of working in sales. He did this awesome uh, show for the New York Comedy Festival where he rented a double-decker uh, tour bus and just gave people a, a Tim Dillon-style tour of New York with all the fucking weirdo shit that's happened, all the, the menage a trois and the, and the murders that have happened around the city. Um, he's just a funny guy. Uh, it's just starting to come into his own, starting to get some heat on him, which is nice. Uh, but I had him come into my apartment to talk about sales. For, oh, first we took a schwitz. We went to, the, uh, went to a bathhouse, straight bathhouse, you guys. One of the weirdest kinds of bathhouses. And we took a Schwitz. The Schwitz is, look, there's a lot of reparations for the Holocaust. Uh, I didn't see any of those. You know, black people want their 40 acres and a mule. I want my reparations for the Holocaust. But I don't get it because I wasn't in the Holocaust. Black people, you weren't slaves. So neither one of us are going to get it. I know. I know. You feel the effects of slavery. Absolutely. And I feel the effects of the Holocaust. I, sure. It's tough. Being in, a, being in a position where black men, black people are, are shot at because because cops are scared of them. It sucks being in, a, in an environment, in a socioeconomic background that won't allow you to rise up through the ranks and achieve the American dream. Sure, that's tough. But you know what's also tough? Getting scolded if you don't finish everything on your plate because your grandfather didn't have the luxury of, of having a full plate. Whose life is tougher? It's hard to say. Um... But in the meantime, while I try to figure out what I was, uh, what tangent I was going off on, where was I going with that? Jews and the Holocaust. 
I mean, I, I don't have any idea of what I was talking about just now. The joke was that black people have had it tough, but Jews have had it harder. Reparations for the Holocaust, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. By the way, I'm not high, in case you're wondering. This is from a lifetime of marijuana abuse, not for tonight's. Jews have had it hard. Reparations for the Holocaust, we're not going to get it. Well, it's gone, you guys. The important thing, like Joe Rogan used to always tell me, said if you can't remember, it wasn't important. That wasn't me farting. That was my uh, heat. Um, it's kind of bothersome when you realize that marijuana has done this to your brain. And I haven't smoked much lately. I've smoked a little more in the last few days. After my special, I'm like, let's party a little bit. But it's not Schwitz. Jews never got our reparations. <laughs> but one thing we did get is a, is a love of the Schwitz. My dad built for himself when he turned 70, I think. He built a sauna for himself in his basement. It's one of, the, uh, one of his joys going down there. And I love it. I love visiting at home and using that sauna. So me and Tim Dillon, I introduced him to the sauna uh, environment. Um, we went in where there's multiple steam rooms and bathroom houses, whatever. Um, you just go and sweat. It's so much fun. You just go and sweat and sweat and sweat. After, you know, they say don't spend more than 30 minutes in each one. You go outside, you drink some water, you talk. It's got a long history of gossip. You just talk about stuff. It's so fun. God, it's so fun. Dirty, for sure. But they have showers. So many Jews are there, the long-haired ones. Not the long hair on the top, but I mean long hair on the sides, if you know what I mean. Do you know what I mean, Pais? Um, so he did that. Uh, then we got a delicious burger at this place I've been trying to get, the, the something room, the, I don't know, somewhere in the East Village. Um, I passed by it 100 times, but I always walk by it late at night. It's too late, but, you know, Tim's a fatty. So he was like, no, no, it's good. I've had it. Obviously, you have. So we ate there, and then we did this podcast. So it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's just start. Uh, and by the way, thank you for making this year uh, the most downloaded Skeptic Tank year ever. I'm going to probably go over a million downloads again for three straight months. That's crazy. A million? That's nutty. Uh, my special will be out in the uh, spring, by the way. But um, yeah, thank you all for, for doing that. So let's start the episode. You can, by the way, and continue to tell your friends about this podcast. Uh, I'm sure they'll enjoy it. If you like this one, as always, do me a favor. Reach out on Twitter. Or on Facebook, or they're, they're, if you're not on Twitter or Facebook, don't do Facebook. It sucks. you got to get off there. i, I got to delete my goddamn account. I'm down to 400 and something friends. I did a whole year of on people's birthdays. I would delete them if I didn't know them or really remember, remember where I met them. And then once I got through the people I don't even remember where I knew them from, I went to the people. And I'm like, I don't really want you in my life. And then I got it down to about 1,000, and then I just did a big purge. And I was like, you're not a friend friend. I know you. I don't need to have you in here. This is for my friend friends. Down to four, 400 and something. Anyway, reach out, on, uh, reach out on Twitter. Let them know you liked the episode. You enjoyed him. He's funny. Uh, follow his, their Twitters. Today, Tim Dillon. Tomorrow, who knows? Uh, and if you can't, if you're not on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, go on their websites and fucking figure it out. Tim Dillon's at uh, probably Tim Dillon. On, on, let me find out. Nope, you never would have gotten it. It's Tim J. Dillon. D-I-L-L-O-N. Um, and oh, timdillontalks.tumblr.com. Do you really not have a website, you fucking moron? I mean, that sort of works, a Tumblr, but come on. It's not fucking... <coughs> it's not fucking 2007. Go to Squarespace. They're not even sponsoring this podcast. Go to Squarespace, you moron. Um, anyway, yeah. Tell the people you like it. It helps me get podcast list, uh, guests, and it also makes me feel good that uh, they get some support. Um, I remember Justy Dodge when we did uh, that podcast, especially cutting. Um, or overhearing her talking to someone else. She's never gotten any response like that. So you guys are always cool about reaching out. Um, make sure to download this episode on uh, the Laughable app. You guys should start be getting those. Uh, I am now going into business with them. To give them any notes or tips on how to improve their their app. If you guys have any suggestions, tweet it laughable. 
L A U G H A B L A. Um, I just think it's a good app for podcasts. I've watched it. I've looked at it. it helps comics connect with with fans and helps fans connect with the comics. And it's way easier to use than that stupid awful iPhone app. They don't have anything for Android, so sorry for people who managed to get free. Um, but if you have an iPhone, it's there. It's a way better app than, than what's available right now. And it's free. So download it and uh, you know you can subscribe. Everything they have on the, or your old apps for, for podcasts, this has, and way more. You'll see it. Give it a chance. Oh, also, also, before I forget, this is not happening. Season finale. Season finale this Thursday night at midnight Eastern and Western, 11 o'clock Central. I don't know about the mountain. Um, oh, what a good episode, you guys. Greg Fitzsimmons, Ali Sadiq, Joey Diaz, all on one show. Set those goddamn VCRs and make sure to set it for an extra three or four minutes on either end. Comcast, Time Warner, they fuck it up. I don't know how. I don't know why. I keep getting reports. Set it for fucking 1156 to 1237. What are you saving space for? This, it does not give you physical space. Just go crazy. Um, the final episode of the year. Don't forget to tune in. Every year, the ratings for the Joey Diaz episode are th- through the roof. At some point, Comedy Central is going to wake up and go, oh, shit, we got to fucking, fucking put this guy on TV. Um, so don't forget to tune in. It's been a wonderful season. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, yeah, that's it. Set your DVRs or, or stay home and watch it. Watch with a friend. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Argy Fritz, Captain Tank, episode 288, Death of a Salesman with Tim Dillon, starts now. Well, they call me a suit of salesman, cause selling is all I do. I've got an endless stash of expensive trash, I want to sell to you, cause I'm a super salesman, a super, super salesman. What happened to that windscreen? You I don't know. On there? What's in your hand? Oh, no, nothing. Oh, there was yeah. I'm just eating it. I just have it. It's falling out of my mouth. You're like, what did you do? I'm like, nothing. So what did you think overall of that experience? For what? The, the, the baths? Yeah, yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I, I didn't know what to expect, but it's a very interesting like, uh, group of people. The age range is interesting. You have young people. You have very old people. A lot of the, the curls. A lot of the curls. A lot of orthodox. You have people dressed in that black outfit, which is terrifying. Ahead of time. Oh, you mean the robe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, The yeah. black robes terrify me. Really? So I, well, I've read a lot about satanic cults. So when I see a flo- when I see a floor-length black robe. A, a public day Yeah, robe. like an old dude. In the middle of the day with a black robe on. Is that a ceremonial robe? Yeah, I'm like, what is, what's about to happen? And they're all going into one room. I'm like, oh, this is going to be. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was, it was good. Like, Bring I. a child and some milk. Yeah, I was glad that everybody, there were some really good looking people. Everybody was in shape, but the one girl, there were some girl. fatties. That was so fatty, I felt yeah. fine. I didn't feel like I you was. feel like I had a, yeah. It's no. Not, it's not like a. The beach where it's like, look at us all showing off our bodies. It's right. Like nothing to do with that. Yeah. It, it was, I felt welcome. Yeah. And uh, I'll definitely go again. I'm into it. Yeah. I love that it's attached to like a luncheonette where people are just eating white fish. Herring and white fish. Herring. Fucking old Jewish. This is the old old New York. This is like gone. This is one of the only. 1800s. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It reminds me of that scene in Eastern Promises where they, they I think they stabbed the guy. That was the, the movie with Viggo Mortensen, in the Russian I movie. That. Yeah. And yeah, they so stabbed. That seems like that yeah. place. It's exactly what it, I was waiting for like a, a Russian mafia. Do you get gangsters in a place like that? You probably do. Probably do. Yeah. Not like the time in, in that movie, though. That was right. like a gangster place. That was like a gangster place. This is like a Jew. Right. An older. Not many women there either. Not a ton. A few. And laying down on the, uh, on the, on the uh, seats, in the room, you know, they talk about mansplain, like uh, manspreading on the subway, and it's like there's five seats being taken up by one woman in that sauna. Manspreading and the idea of it. Is yeah, that, I, I call it king sitting. Sit like a king. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is this: I've seen people like when it's not a crowded subway, right? And men sit that way. Yeah. That's, right, you know, when no one's around, how you say anybody, they just kind of sit like this. And women are like, "Well, don't do that." When it's crowded, it's like, okay, but have some respect for like we have this fucking thing dangling right. between our legs 
that hurts when you fucking close your legs too. Yeah, tight. right. Don't just act like. Just easily change it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And maybe this underground rat tunnel isn't meant to be a luxurious mode of transportation. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Maybe this catacombs and this hellscape that we travel through every day, yeah. we shouldn't start micromanaging. You know, there are people that I've been on the J train where somebody was just bleeding for several stops, just profusely bleeding. And, and it's like, you know, I don't feel like man spreading's the the big issue. Yeah. That's that's the uh, everything's, <laughs> everything's working out well when you can get to man spreading. It it's that's you talk about privilege. You talk about getting angry about if I'm on the subway and I don't get stabbed and nobody vomits in Holy the car I'm in. I'm happy. Yeah, happy. <laughs> it is this weird thing. You gotta like, should I be fighting you about? Taking yeah, no, taking an Uber. Also, it's like I don't do that. Yeah. Like, if there's not enough room, yeah. I'm moving my legs apart. Right. Fucking oaf behavior. Yeah. it's. I, I think the people that are doing that are, are probably doing worse. Yeah. Leave them, leave them be. The guy that's doing that is, like, near his breaking yeah, point. Yeah, when you try to get into a, a thing and some guy won't, like, put his legs right. together or, like, move a little bit. Like, yeah. You, I mean, you're taking up, intentionally taking up two seats here. Yeah. Do you mind just sliding over into one? But this, this city, I'm always like, that guy might be... Two seconds away from no, his so, yeah, you breaking leave him. point. You leave, leave him, him big. And, and it's like, well, he's not moving. So right. That's the last guy I want to sit yeah. next to. Because I feel like an hour later, you're in a you're in a precinct, and the cops going, "Tell us what happened right before you got stabbed in the face." You know, and I'm like, well, you know. How long would you sit next to near somebody with like piss smell before you just get up and move to another part of? The- I get a lot of anxiety, so I have to move around. I I get very bad. I also read that people smell weird things before they're about to have a stroke. So I'm paranoid on the su- so I'll literally be like, Does, is that piss? Is everyone smelling that? <laughs> is everyone smelling <laughs> So I have to go. I just have to walk away. Yeah. You know? And then it's easy. Yeah. I had to take off. I smelled strawberries the other day in the subway, but it was because somebody had a fucking, you know, shitty strawberry lip gloss or whatever it is. You know what I'm like? Is everyone to smell strawberries? I'm I'm that guy. I'm like a lunatic. And I'm like, is you know? And then some other guy's like, yeah, I smell it. I'm like, but maybe me and him are like both having Having strokes. (laughs) Just one long stroke. That's the best when you start to like reevaluate to like, I'll still make it work. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's too much anxiety. And I hate the subway. And I love Uber. Really? And it has nothing to do with getting anywhere on time. No, it's I love, more expensive. I love, me and Jay talked about it last night. Jay it has idiot. nothing to do with time. It has everything. Jay had summarized it perfectly. He, is, he hates it somewhere. He never it has it. everything to do with avoiding stairs and being dropped off right at the location, the door of the location. It just laying back in that Uber, everything's okay. I mean, you re- you can talk on your phone. You don't get out of service. You can talk on your phone. You can throw your headphones in. You don't have to. I If I'm on a subway. There's no missing your stop. No missing the stop. The su- I know what's going on. Oh, that's a fucking mouse in the wall. That's a mouse in the wall. That is a sizable mouse. I feel like the thing from Caddyshack's about to just jump out. That was like they're having a battle in there. Yeah, they loud. might be fighting. Wow. Okay. Where is it in the wall? But it hasn't come through here yet. I've been hearing that thing a little bit, but that was louder than I've ever heard it. It's amazing in New York City. You'll never get away from mice. I have friends that live on Fifth Avenue right by the park, and you know they live in a t- whatever it is, eight, $10 million apartment, something crazy, and they're like, yeah, the mice just run across the floor. Really? <laughs> yeah. In a like, yeah. million-dollar place? Dude, in a multi-million-dollar pre-war beautiful Jeez. building, yeah, what are you going to do? It's the only reason I want to go to one of those super modern ones. Yeah. Like elevator 15 yeah. floors up. You're like, there's no mice here. You know, you don't think so. They'll figure it out. Yeah. They'll figure it out. They always do. Pests, things like that. They always figure out a way in. Little hole. They come in with food. They come in and, pe- you know. That's so funny. I thought literally that was just the beginning of some type of building crumbling. Yeah, it looked like it was, something was falling. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is the end. Can you imagine just an avalanche buried, a podcast, like guys finding us holding microphones? It's like the final podcast, you know? <laughs> like it's still going. Yeah. Yeah. One time I came in here and I had a mouse a year ago. I Big? The door and I just saw something scurry that way. Wow. Like, Motherfucker. I yeah. Just corner your eye kind of thing. Yeah, I had a, I lived in an apartment in Brooklyn where the woman said, hey, we don't have a garbage. We just take everything outside immediately. And I said, let me ask why. And she goes, we have a bad mice problem. Really? And I said, I wonder what a bad oh. mice problem is. 
I only lasted there about a few months, but the uh, it was you heard them, you heard them like conversing, like like my sounds, like squeals and squeaks. Oh yeah, it was bad. Having powwows. Yeah, having powwows, plotting an overthrow. <laughs> so you had to literally, you'd have to, you'd finish a yogurt and throw it outside. Well, she'd have a bag that was attached to the doorknob, and we'd put it all in the bag. And then at the end of the day, you'd have to just go chuck it yeah. outside. I'll do that. Or I'll leave, uh, uh, yeah. like if you have like, let's say you have a pizza box. So it's got right. cheese in there. Something edible. That yeah. Makes, you'd put it in your fridge. Yeah. You put right. garbage in your fridge. Right. Who gives a shit? Until it's time to, yeah. Like, I can't get to it yeah. until it's time to take it out. Now I live in a building with a guy who is on the first floor. His uh, aunt owns the building. He's a sanitation worker. So he's like a Nazi about what goes where. He'll go through the garbage. To find oh, something really? that shouldn't it's be in the garbage. Yeah. Uh, he'll flip out. He's like a skinhead guy. He's a shaved head. Uh, always at the gym. Always ready to just pounce on you for one infraction. You're like, dude, let it fucking go. Ugh. Yeah. We had, um, I, uh, I love those landlords. They're like, oh, I got fine. I was like, oh, <laughs> sorry. Our landlord tells us what a good deal we have all the time. It's like really? as if someone else made the deal. <laughs> she made the deal. Do you have a good deal? We have a great deal, oh. but it's good, but it's not amazing. I mean, listen, we have an old building, the toilets from 1910 or whatever. Listen, she could get a few hundred more for the apartment, no doubt. I think she thinks she could get a lot more. It's like, yeah, you could get a lot more if you do a renovation. If the fucking hot water worked. What if landlords are the same as like comics where they, they see some other comic getting something? And right. Like, oh, I'm better than that guy. Yes. I would yes. say like an apartment like, oh, I could rent it for more than that. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, yeah, that one's too expensive though. A hundred percent. I think they go around the neighborhood and they're like 2100 a month. Yeah. Oh, these fuckers are beat. And then all of a sudden. You're like, you know, they have washer dryers in the room. Yeah. Or, yeah. Like, no, no, it doesn't matter. And then all of a sudden it becomes a thing where you somehow deceived them. Like, you should have told them during the negotiation. You should have said, listen, I got to be honest. This seems too fair. <laughs> market value is another 400 bucks. Why don't you go and do some research and come back? It's like, you know, market value is what you tell me it is. And I go, I can afford that. Thanks. You know? So then it becomes like she's hunting us down. And she'll be like, you have such a good deal. You don't know. You don't know how good you have. It's what she said the other day as I was walking in the building. She goes, she's an old lady, like an old Eastern European or Ukrainian. She's like, you don't know how good you have it. She's just smelling like vodka and smoking a cigarette. I'm like, honey, you gave it to us. I, what do you want us to do? Yeah. But that she's old enough now. We're like, husband's dead. Kids are dead. Oh, really? So this Yeah. Is well, the kids aren't dead. I mean, the kids are wherever they are. They're not with her. They ran. Yeah. But this is the life. Her buildings are her life now. She has more than one? She's got a few. I mean, that's the thing about New York, man. If you inherited or grew up or bought real estate at the right time, you were in big time. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I would- Trump made a lot of his money. Yeah. Bought real estate here. Yeah. Just shot up. Who? Donald Trump. Yeah. He's a uh, pre- president-elect. Yeah. He's a <laughs> My new thing is. Uh, I don't know when this episode calling, comes out, but calling yeah. someone stupid when um, when um, when they're not stupid, they just didn't hear you. Yeah, and you're like, uh, <laughs> you're like, oh, I went to Ireland. Yeah. It, where? Oh, it's this country near the UK. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, yeah. I know what Ireland is. I yeah, didn't fucking hear they you just go. flip out. Yeah. but it's so funny, weird. Even when you say Donald Trump is a president elect, it's still hard to believe. Yeah. So I'm still listening to it and going, wow, yeah. like this is a moment. What's Trump? You know, this is a real moment now. It's fascinating. It really is. You know, but uh, I had a dude, you know, I was a, I was a tour guide and we used to wait on those double decker buses. And when your bus shift would end and you'd wait for the next one, you'd go and hang out in this frozen yogurt place. And there was this older guy, an Arab guy. I don't know from where, maybe Egypt. I'm not sure. But he had bought a building on Columbus Avenue in like the 70s. Bought a building. Like, bought a building in the what 70s. He had money. A building. Yeah, bought a building. And he had a, a big commercial real estate firm come in, a bunch of guys in suits, and they came in and they were, they were kind of telling him what they could get for it. And I think they were talking like $30 million. What? Yeah. And that's the type of investment where you're like, whoa. He was prime Columbus Avenue, right in the heart of everything, Upper West Side, mixed Tell use building, whatever. I heard in this neighborhood, Alphabet City, there were yeah. places where you could- for $500, yeah. you get a building, but you had to live in it. 
Yeah. For a certain amount of uh, yeah. two years. You could not live in it. Well, there was years. that famous squatter thing, C Squat on Avenue C. Oh, really? Yeah. There people was just a, abandoned their places. And he, people people, just, yeah, people just go and hang out and they had squatters' rights and all this stuff. I mean, how do you even get in the first place? Well, because people, you know, this was no man's land for a very long time. The mayor was like, I nobody can't cared. It, you know, nobody cared. Nobody was coming down here to invest and go, I really want to live on Avenue C. Yeah. The, you know? The word had no, it was it was like the you know it was like the show Rent. It was you know, yeah, you know, transsexuals, AIDS, fucking. Was that here? Was Rent here? Yeah, Avenue ABC. Oh, really? This was it, Alphabet City. Oh. You know, she says, "Oh, well, I'm the feline of Avenue B." Oh. I mean, this was the heart of you know AIDS and you know all the good stuff, all the fun, wild, you know. So people didn't necessarily nobody was coming in here. This had some sort of like. Uh, Code of like A is like all right, and yeah, B is whatever, and then D is death. Yeah, like, no, it moved on. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. great. It wasn't good. But I remember, man, back when I was a little kid, I was an actor, and I used to do plays in these little black box theaters that were in the East Village, and a lot of the restaurants in this area would have. You would walk in and you see like a bunch of headshots on a wall. You'd be like, what the fuck is that? And it would be like the, whatever play was going on downstairs. They would be like no name actors. And, and, and if you walk downstairs, it would be a small black box theater in the basement of whatever oh, restaurant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like it could, could be a French restaurant, Italian restaurant. And people would do plays. You know, people would do uh, whatever, poetry. I'm sure people did comedy. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But now all that's done. You're losing a lot of that. You know, unfortunately, like, I see a new building go up and it's like yeah. nice, right? And that one over there, where it's yeah, like, it's like, yeah. Eh. I mean, yeah, but it's just like soulless. Well, the people that are living here now, the people that are moving here, are not the ones writing plays and going, no. "Hey, come see my play." Yeah, they're the ones that are moving here now are the ones that are like, "I want to be around the playwrights." Yeah, well, guess what? They're, they're not they here. Live here anymore. A couple of the ones that just stayed, maybe, but yeah. you're certainly not it. Yeah, I mean, these were wounded people. I did a play, and it was this woman, Ela, wrote it. And I, I still remember. I was probably like 11 years old, 12 years old. And the play was about getting molested by her father. Oh. You know, and, and he came to see the play. What? It was called Christmas Dreamers Awaken. Did and it he was like, her? I, I don't know, but I would imagine he did, you know? Uh, and uh, so, again, these are like the wounded, and this is how she was working that out, was writing a play about it. It was about this awkward Christmas dinner where nobody was bringing up the fact that dad was a rapist and he molested everybody. I mean, that's awkward. I played, it was more awkward because I played the molester at no nine. Way. You were no, ten. I'm kidding. No, I was just a kid at the, the party. But this is the type of people that were there, you know? Cool people. Cool people. The damaged, the damned. Yeah. Yeah, it's changed. It's different. I like when neighborhoods change, but then you find out the history of it, and people are all upset. And then you're like, yeah. you know, it used to be a completely white neighborhood. Right. And then I got poor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Then yeah. the artists moved in because right. they were so poor. Right. And then the white people moved in because the artists moved in. I like the second wave of gentrification. That's where I am. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, it's still, there's Coke around and yeah. stuff. But it's like, I'll go in. Right. The artists kind of like make <laughs> yeah. sure there's a Starbucks or something. Yeah. And then the wave after me is the people who have no relation to the arts whatsoever. Right. Who are right. just like, empty and just like yeah you're like, oh, yeah get out of here well you see that in williamsburg now i think they're on that where oh, it's like yeah, lululemon yeah, yeah. zara yeah and then those people start having kids and oh stay yeah there. she sees guys with tattoos fucking pushing strollers oh yeah and then it's like Ugh, lame this whole place is lame yeah and it's also you have french and like you know wealthy people from italy and france the kids are like dad buy me an apartment here buy i want to live here buy me an apartment yeah buy me an apartment here that's what drives the rent up most. Is yeah. The off, offshore. Absolutely. Rentals. You know, and because there's instability all over the world. If you have a lot of money, it's probably not a bad idea to own something in America. Some of them don't even fucking rent it out. They do nothing. It they, sits there. Oh. 70%. A lot of the new construction in New York and London yeah. are sold, you know, and this is changing like now. Shit. Well, they're sold to uh, foreign investors. In, foreign investors make up half of the real estate purchases in New York City. Really? And about 60% in London, people from outside of the country. Although those numbers are going to be altered by the fact that all of those foreign buyers never bought anything primarily under their own name. They bought it under a shell corporation. So what? So they could hide taxes. They wanted to stash money and they wanted to evade taxes. But New York City has said, now we're going to make that a little harder because even if you own a shell corp and you want to buy real estate, you have to tell us who you are. Who owns that corporation? Yeah. 
How weird. Why? And they're doing that to increase transparency so that foreign criminals and people can't like that can't just money. hide money in America. And it's really like the average apartment. I mean, the average uh, condo to buy in New York right now is hovering at about $2 million. It is Damn. so expensive. Damn. And it has been made that in expensive. LA, you get a massive place for that. <laughs> you get a great house. Two million? Two million. You probably get 1,200 square feet, you know? Depending on where you go. I don't know. I'm bad at just looking. I don't know what those mean. So, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's so expensive and the outcry is so much that it's like, well, we have to slow this down a little bit. Where are they going to go after this? I was walking by somewhere and it showed pictures of Manhattan, some office building, 40th. And uh, it said, like, until the late 1800s, Manhattan was mostly farmland. Right. Yeah. There's well, no farm right well, look what happened in that time. You know what I mean? Look how we just the, the way we lived was revolutionized. And that might happen. I mean, and I'm sure it will yeah, happen yeah. in the next hundred years. Yeah. You but know? Like, so if you're poor before, you can still be in Manhattan. You just got to go to one of those burbs that like weren't good. Yeah. But they don't I, have those now. You so don't now, have them. Well, you got to go to Bushwick. You got to go farther and further away. You got to go further and further out. And then you're like, well, nobody wants to be there. Right. You want to be in a poor neighborhood near yeah. the thing. Well, I think I mean I think the eventual march is is I mean I I, I think it's it's going to be not it's gonna, not going to be New York, uh, right. it's going to be somewhere else. Yeah, to make I mean, go to other place and make that the hub. I mean, maybe not. I don't know. You know, there there are people that people have been saying that for a long time, and it's kind of never been. It's never that's never come to fruition. Yeah. You know, like everyone says, like no man, Detroit's going to be it, and it's like yeah, that doesn't. Dude, they are that's never happened. Houses for one hundred dollars in Detroit. Yeah, it's not good. And none of us are buying them. No. I don't know why we're not. I mean, because we don't have faith that it's going to get better. I guess so. Some of those houses were one dollar. Yeah. So Detroit's going to get better one hundred percent, but or it'll be gone. Or it'll be gone. One but or the other. I mean, you look around and you don't have that faith. Like, you know, because you look at Harlem and you go, well, Harlem was so close to Manhattan. It's such a quick commute. It's on the island of Manhattan. It's not, it's not even an outer borough. It's not Brooklyn. It's not Bronx. So investors in the 90s were, were picking up brownstones for twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Okay. Oh, oh waiting, yeah. Waiting. Fire sale prices and waiting. Waiting for the white wave to like. Take it over. Waiting for the the economy to repair itself, the city to get safe, for all this stuff, and that is. I don't think it's happening in Detroit as much because you got to have a ton of money to just go and speculate about a city yeah. that you have no, you know, you have no real connection to. Yeah. I can't tell you why Detroit is going to eventually get back on its feet and be. You just think it would because it's always been there. I mean, there. you just imagine that it would, but we don't know. With Manhattan, though, it's like you have neighborhoods on both sides of the shitty neighborhood that are good and growing. So it's like it's going to overtake that middle shitty neighborhood. Absolutely. You would imagine. Yeah. You would imagine. Yeah. Where Metzger lives now in Harlem, where it used to be like kind of shit. It's now it's like, oh, it's nice now. Well, there's so much money in New York. The default has always been that there's so much money that at the end of the day, it's going to work itself out. Yeah. You know? It's not tenable to live here. No. Not long term. Can't get old here. Yeah. You see old here. New York old is different. It's people fighting on a, you know, to just walk up the stairs in a subway. There's a oh, death has time. to be such a release. Uh, when you live here. Right? When you're older and you live here, death has got to be such a welcoming. Like you're telling me some of these fuckers don't just lay down every night and go, I hope tonight's tonight. Uh. <laughs> I hope, like, I hope I don't have to hear that six train rumble by at six a.m. again. I saw an old lady with a cane, yeah, texting and walking. Might have been somebody else, but I think it was me. And uh, she slams her cane in front of me, like slacks it on the ground a bunch. Wow! Goes, Look up! <laughs> and I to be like, oh, you were here before there were any cell phones. Yeah, <laughs> you're in New York. This doesn't happen. Yeah, but this ain't you're in New York anymore. Right? This is happening. All she was getting so frustrated. Like, she was getting angry. People, it's annoying when you see somebody texting and walking too slowly. Yeah. I'm like, oh, get off your fucking move. Right. Yeah, what are you doing? Stand to the side. Right. Right. How People, did that tour go? It was great. It was a lot of fun. It was... It was Packed? It was packed. We sold out three uh, shows. The tour bus is double-decker tour bus. It holds about 60 people, about 55 people up top, and then people on the bottom as How well. on the bottom? Uh, 20, okay. but you know, everybody wants to be on top. Yeah. The, the bottom was kind of industry people or comps that we had given out, oh, really? but my agent in her, uh, 
wisdom, we had oversold the first tour, but we had Sal Volcano and Chris Gethard on top, and they were comps, you know? And uh, so my agent's standing. They were letting the people on the bus. And in front of people who had not, now everything is full up top. The only thing that is fucking available is downstairs. And I was a tour guide. Nobody wants downstairs, especially not for a comedy tour of yeah, fucking New York City. The who the fuck wants to be downstairs where you can't even see the buildings? You're not New York to get is somewhere. Yeah, it's a vertical city. Yeah, you have to look yeah. up. Yeah. So she says in front of the people getting on the bus, she goes, listen, Tim, she goes, we got nothing upstairs, but she goes, even though Sal and Chris are cops, we should leave them up there. And I'm like, oh, and then these two people like we bought tickets and I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. And it's just like, shouldn't you have a little, you know, and I, I love her. She's great. But it's like, shouldn't you have a little, you know, just the knowledge of not saying that in front of people? So a few people were mad that they had to sit downstairs. All in all, it was a lot of fun. People had a great time. A lot of people had never been on long, that thing. How long was it? Long it's been it? an hour and 15 minutes. It's an hour, 15, 20 minutes. And we're, point, you know, we're going by all of these really wealthy buildings, these incredibly wealthy and powerful people. And it's, it's at night. So you could look in the windows. You could point oh. out these private clubs on Fifth Avenue where they're having cocktail parties with black oh, really? ties. And yeah. The Illuminati people. Yeah. I'm like, that's where, you know, the Knickerbocker Club, that's where, that's where they plan Kennedy's assassinate. You know, I'm going, doing all these crazy things. And, you know, people, I think people really, it was a lot of fun. Because it is, listen, it is a different world. It, it is like taking a tour of another planet. When you go down Fifth Avenue and I tell you that, like, this school is $60,000 a year to send your children mm. to third grade, you know, and even high school. Like, and I tell yeah, you. Yeah. Is that for the good education or to keep undesirables away? It's for everything. Both, yeah. You know, it's for, you know, a certain uh, segment of our society to be able to perpetuate itself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You pay a lot of money. Uh, for that peace of mind that you know your child is not going to be socializing with a, drug you addicts. know, right? Sid Ruff, oh no, a, definitely a drug addict, oh, but yeah. a different type of drug addict. Yes, yeah, a ton of those yeah. kids are in rehab three times by the time they're eighteen. I have this theory that uh, one of the Obama kids was definitely did coke because really because like she went to the rich they went to the rich people's school. I'm sure they've had fun. And then I looked it up. My friend was like, "You can't just say that for no reason. That's not a theory. I'm yeah, like, oh, a theory. <laughs> it's not proven, but yeah, it's a theory. Yeah, it is a theory." Uh, Ari, said, that's fake news. Yeah. But I put I searched <laughs> Sidwell Friends Coke and a fucking story came up. Yeah, drug bust. I'm like, so you know it's around. Yeah, and you know some senator's son or some judge's oh, son. Well, Joe Biden's like, daughter. There was a video of Joe Biden's daughter doing a line, and really? that's yeah, that's you know uncontested. Wow, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you tell the Secret Service like we're fine. Go upstairs. Yeah, I mean, listen. Why do you think Trump's secure your fucking house? Trump's kids hate him, and I'm sure they're very angry now because they had the best they lives in the world. Yeah. They could, they were globe trotting, doing fucking whatever they wanted to, coke in their face all the time. Now they have the Secret Service watching them. Everybody's mad and hates them now. Now they can't go to fucking. I can't even say your last name is Trump. Yeah, you can't go to the fucking Paris and party the way you used to. You know. It's like, man, you could see them when they were all, they all did an interview. I think it was 60 Minutes. None of them looked happy. Really? Yeah, Melania, none of them looked happy. You're going to get attacked for the next four years. Everything you do is going to be under a microscope. You know? I mean, listen, that's fun if your dad's a senator. You're like, oh, yeah, now he gets to be the president. Not when your dad's a billionaire. Right yeah, if I'm, if I'm living in D.C. <laughs> and, I, and my dad's a senator of Wyoming, yeah, it's like right. uh, nobody even knows his yeah. name. This is like, it's fun. It's almost like, oh, your dad's a senator? Cool. Yeah. It's fun to move into the White House when you come from like a regular house and yeah. your dad's a senator, but it's not fun when you're leaving your penthouse apartment in the greatest city in the world. Norton, oh, he, he's friends with uh, the son. It's Trump's son. Okay. He says he's a normal, cool guy. And yeah. I was like, is he going to go live in the White House? He goes, he's 40. I'm like, I know. Right. That would be so cool. That would be great. Live in the White House as a 40 year old. <laughs> Bring chicks back. It's the there. best way to live in the White House. Yeah, a forty-year-old man. What time you be home? Late. Yeah. Don't turn the alarm on. <laughs> we real late. Yeah, just sleeping. Just partying Rolls all over DC. Tours. Hi guys. Yeah. I'm his son. No. I'm yeah. His son. Let's see. Look a little like him. Yeah, I'm the guy. I'm forty. <laughs> I'm having a midlife crisis. Where in the Lincoln bedroom? You know, that's a whole different world. But yeah, I mean, it's got to be. What was that bedroom before Lincoln? I don't know. It's just like a, it's a good room. question. I have no pool, idea. Pool place? I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. I got to piss again. 
I got a piss too. There's something about what do you think? It's something about the fucking sauna. Sauna. Also, we drank a lot of water. We drank so much water. Yeah, but we sweat most of the time. We drank the type of water. Like that's when I was when I was getting drug tested as a teenager. I'm like, mom, I'm, I would drink that type of water, that level of water to flush. <laughs> and then you'd pee clear, and you'd look yeah. at your drug counselor, and you'd be like, what? And the drug counselor would be like, you know what? And I'd be like, what do you mean? I'm eating a healthy diet. Did you have to do that a lot? I was. They sent me to an outpatient rehab in Long Island. Really? What were you on? Uh, just weed. But but I was on other things too. But all they could prove was weed because Coke's three days. Three days out of your system? Yeah, it's done. Piss. Blood might be longer. Hair is forever. You know. I mean, hair is. Forget it. Really? You test hair. I think it's. Oh, uh, because it's also like your hair has to grow. I think it's a out. long time. I don't know the exact time, but. But yeah, you would pee and they'd be like, oh, you're on weed. So you'd go sit there with a bunch of other people. Would you shave your head before you went into a haircut? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, no, oh, yeah. Sorry. But like you would, you would sit there in rehab and they'd be like, all right, everyone's going to pee. And you know, some people would try to pee with a fake dick. I mean, everybody, listen, really? I mean, oh yeah, dude. I mean, people would try every, because it was court mandated. So if you got fucked, some of them were going to jail. Really? Oh yeah. I, I wasn't court mandated, but the court had really man- mandated you, your mama. Yeah. She was like, you're going to rehab. You got to, you got to straighten it out. Like, no, mama. I was we, like, we knew the guy who did the, remember the Wizenator? You, things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. The Wizenator. Or what was that? Golden Seal? What was that? Golden Seal was a thing you would drink. That was like a huge thing. It was like in high times, would advertise and it, it would all the cover time. up everything? Yeah, Golden Seal, supposedly. I don't know if it worked or not. And then people said, drink uh, tea. There was a certain type of tea. Really? And then there was, you could drink the two gallons of water, which is what me and you just did. Yeah. And then there was... Uh, a gallon? One of those things, a gallon? I think one of them is... Is it? No, maybe not. Oh, maybe a half gallon. I'm not sure. But, and then, what a gallon is. And then, the, then there was the... Uh, you know, it, you know, there's some way to dilute it if you pee in a cup. But the people would look at you. They would watch you pee. They would hand you a cup. You would go pee, and they would stand behind you. We knew a guy whose job it was to watch people pee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the that's an interesting way to make man. a. Isn't that amazing? If that's all you do all your whole life, you just watch people pee. Yeah, I'm an integral part of the justice system. <laughs> what do you do? I watch people pee. The criminal justice is made up of multiple, multiple <laughs> parts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the, the police, police who investigate the crime, right, and the guys who watch people piss <laughs> when they've been mandated to rehab. <laughs> but everybody who works in that re and that's a weird world too. That world of rehab, rehab? you know? Because uh, you get lied to all the time. You get lied to all the time, and it's like, do you really want me to get better? You know what I mean? Right. It's like a weird, it's like, I feel like you do. And you can't be like, hey, I just, you know, I know you're lying. I see a lot of you, so I know Yeah, and then it's weird when you were the head of the rehab, and I asked you what you did last year, and you look at me with a straight face, and you go, oh, home invasions. Really? Yeah. Head of the rehab used to like, do crime stuff? Yeah, uh, yeah, dude. All the t- the people who own sober houses are all ex-addicts. And they, some of them don't have a ton of clean times. So you're like, all right, you've been sober for two years. What did you do before that? Yeah, it broke into people's houses. Oh, okay. And and I'm not allowed to have my cell phone. <laughs> it's like a weird. So, but you got to accept that authority. You got to accept authority immediately of like, Regardless okay. Regardless of who it's from. 100%. Damn. So, and they're making a lot of money, especially if you cater to rich kids, the kids we were just talking about. Yeah. Those insurance plans will pay out 30, 40 grand a month for those kids to fucking get better. So, like, get them in here. Oh, get them in there. You know? I know a guy who does uh, sober companionships. Jesus, what is that? Rich, rich people who want to keep their sons uh, clean. This sounds like something I'm into. Go live with him. Oh. Uh, take him around. Make sure he doesn't get on anything. Make sure he doesn't touch wow. any drug. And then if he does, it's a question of either um, let me know and I'll send right. him to rehab or um, just keep it away from him, one or the other. But it's like so now. Does the sober companion go live with the dude? Yeah, they all they do everything together. Wow! Was, and they find ways. They find ways. Oh, to dude! Get of it <laughs> around them, they're like, I go to the bathroom, and suddenly they're like, oh, Yeah, you, you scored there. Yeah, you yeah. Know anybody? You here. just see strobe lights coming from the bathroom. Yeah, like, like, what another, happened? Another city where they don't know anybody. Yeah. So that you can do that. And, yeah. And then it's like they have to threaten me, like, dude. I'm gonna tell your father. <laughs> You're gonna go to rehab. Oh, oh my god! You're telling some 35 year old guy, I'm gonna tell your dad. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm going to tell you know, your dad. your allowance. Wow. Mr. Smith, yeah. But that's so funny. <laughs> it's so I call him sir and he's still. It's so funny. What do you do for a living? I'm a sober companion. You're like an autism emotional support dog Yeah. as a person. You get paid 24 hours a day. It's great. 
Sounds like a great job. Doesn't sound bad. Doesn't sound bad. We'll go water skiing together. Just make those are those interesting those. jobs. That, there are jobs in New York people don't even, because there are so many wealthy people here, yeah. there are jobs that people don't understand. Mm-hmm. Go explain that to somebody in Montana. Well, even dog walker. Dog walker. Sorry, no. Makeup artist. But not even for like, for rich chicks. For rich. Like, I want to go out tonight. For socialites. Really? For women. They just go over and yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even for like cats. You're not making, it's not a Broadway show. It's like a fucking, somebody's rich because, you know, I'm going to go to this benefit for God only knows what they're fucking, you know, for underprivileged. $5,000 a plate dinners. $10,000 a plate dinner for underprivileged dogs. I like the hamburger we got and it was was great. It was great. Underprivileged dogs. Whatever, whatever, whatever these people, I mean, there's, there are these, and I love this world of rich people. I'll read about it. It's like, you'll see this really wealthy lady who's holding up a sloth and like rainforest defense fund. And you're like, what is that? Where did you get a sloth? Yeah, because they bring them in as a fucking, as like one of those it's things. Like a dumb, yeah, dumber when they had the owl. <laughs> yeah, and they killed that's, them with exact, the yeah. that's exactly what it is. It's real. It's real life there's dumb only and two dumber. Left in the world, and we have them here. It's like oh, there's one left in the world. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. And it's just those funny, those type of jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you can just make a living. Like that's a thing you can do. Yeah. And, like, and do well. Tutors. Tutors, sure. To get kids into kindergarten. Sit down with a three year old and go, listen, you can't be in you can't be a loser when you go in there. With a three year old, dude. These nursery schools, these kindergartens are very tough to get kids in. And you can't get into the middle schools if you aren't into the Oh, best, it's best all it starts when you're schools. in the womb and it's hyper competitive and they go, Listen, these are the wealthiest, most powerful people on the planet. And they want their kids and they want their kids in an institution that's gonna preserve that. So they go, so you bring in a kid and you go, what do you want to do? You know, so kids, no, dude. I mean, there was this one fucking story in a book I read where like these kids went in and they left toys around the room and told the kids like not to play with it. And it was like, it's like torture. Really? And see which kids were like monsters who would just, who was well behaved, who would, you know, it's like insane, you know? They did a study on girls and boys. uh, Yeah. About, uh, you say, okay, uh, I can give you a cookie. Right. But if you don't eat it. Yeah. Um, tomorrow, I will give you two cookies. Wow. If you do eat it, that's the last cookie you get. Boys ate it. Boys like, oh, I'm just eating the cookie. Yeah. The girls like, girls okay, like not playing. Right. Yeah, I can, right. yeah, I can do it. Yeah. Be than one. Yeah. It's fascinating how when I talk, when, you know, one of the lines in my tour bus is like when I point at these buildings, I go, none of this is possible for any of you. <laughs> and it hasn't been since you were seven. You, Affordable. yeah, well, you didn't even know. You were fucked at seven. You don't decide to make a billion dollars at 34. Can it happen? Sure. Yeah. Can anything happen? But what I tell people is like the track these people were on to do this yeah. started at two. Wow. By nine, they had made some of their lifelong connections. Jesus. They went to fucking, really? yeah. yeah. Yeah, those people are all going to be winners too. Dude, they're all going to be, we go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, Camp, you know, Oxford. They go over, they jump across the pond. They do. Now listen, this does, that's not everybody. There's a few dudes, but even if you look at all that tech money, that tech money is not coming from shitty state schools. It's coming from Stanford and Harvard, all those brilliant guys. These are very smart people. What do you mean tech money? You know, because a, a lot of New York City Eastern money is banking and stuff like that. But a lot of the West Coast tech money, where it is more possible to invent an app at 32 and oh, become right. a billionaire. Yeah. But even the guys that are doing that are not coal miners right. from Ohio. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. they're not from West Virginia. You know, that's not where these things emanate from. They come from these very wealthy Marin County, all, you know. And it's like, well, that's one of the things. And that always fascinated me, like how that type of money uh, preserves itself and perpetuates itself. Yeah, yeah. And they're different. I met I met some I met some of the kids that live up there. They're different. They're slightly dull. Really? It, they're, yeah. You know, I mean, when you've been to every continent by the time you're nine, what is what is you're not really enraged you know my friends are angry constantly yeah. or they're very depressed or they're la- or they're but emotion in that world is kind of seen as kind of weakness i was date, i was knew yeah. somebody who was dating one of the olsen twins okay mary kate or ashley whatever <laughs> and we're all around the table talking yeah and um after a while i'm just like in my head you know not out loud yeah. but I'm just like you're a dullard yeah 
you're boring. You're boring. And I'm sure people are like, no, she's got her own fashion line. She's done this and this. I'm like, yeah. I guess so. But yeah. <laughs> all the people con- conversing here, she's the fucking. Well, imagine, one. and she fits into this too. Imagine if you grew up and you lived your entire life knowing that you would always have enough money. Yeah. Number one. Always. How, so now. How freeing is it? How freeing is it? And I don't mean enough by like a little bit. I mean, I mean just you've got enough. So that, yeah. that burden that a lot of us have has been completely lifted. Okay? Because we have enough. Be- well, well, because we, we have it up, but that, that burden for those people has been lifted since birth. So they don't know what it's like. They don't know what that anxiety is like. They don't know what that. Like the 26th of year, I don't have the rent yet. Yeah. They don't know that. They don't, that's not a thing with them. They also know that they're never going to be broke, no matter what really happens. They're never going to be broke. They're never going to fall off the face of the earth. And they like the idea of being broke. And sure. Like you, you buy a ripped pair of jeans. Yeah. You, you, it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. You go to some seedy nightclub and it's, yeah. like, it's like Batman's parents did. Yeah. And it's like, you ain't really living this because you know you have an out whenever you, you want. You have an out whenever like when you want. Job, it, it was like, I'll be done at the end of August. Yeah. So it's not going to wear on me that much. Yeah. Well, know? it was even like, dude, when I was a tour guide, I had it in the back of my mind. I'm going to make a living doing comedy. I'm doing oh, this really? every day. There were people that that's their job. That's, job. that's And it's a tough way to. Now, back in the day, they told me that was a fun job. They used to get drunk. They used to be able oh, to really? take the butt. Well, yeah, because pre Bloomberg, pre all of these regulations, you could just be, you get a bunch of people on a bus, you go, we're going to drive wherever we want and let's fucking stop and go into this bar. And fucking get back on the bus and we're all going to be fucked up. And it's like, wow. oh, that, and they would walk and people were tipping cash because it was a lot of Americans. And then it became like, you know, the balance shifted. Americans stopped coming to New York. Foreign people did. They don't tip. Right. So it confused Ukrainians. Like, why am I giving you money? I just paid for a ticket. And now they're like, no, the bus has got to go on this route. Nobody can get off and, and go drink. Nobody can do anything. Nobody can have any fun. And it became this corporate shitty job. Oh, lame. And it's like, so now it's like the people that used to do it were like, yeah, this was never a phenomenal job, but it was a job for a dude who was like, yeah, I get up at noon and I work drunk. <laughs> you know what I mean? And those, there's not too many jobs left I heard, in uh, New York. some NPR thing about uh, Graceland. Yeah. And somebody was like, we just make stuff up. Right. Like before the internet, <laughs> we were the source. That was it. So then it was like, well, how many, uh, you know, when did Elvis do this? Goes, yeah. Uh, when he was in seventh grade. Yeah. And somebody goes, well, I thought it was when he was in third. <laughs> I go, nope, seventh. Yeah. Who oh, cares? Seventh. That's the other thing. Like before the internet, you needed these wacky tour guides to answer your questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd have to be like, where is pizza? And some fucking lunatic in a safari hat on top of a double decker bus would be like, you got to go to Joe's, you know? Oh, yeah. And that was your Google. How long did you do that for? I did it on and off for about two and a half years. Really? Yeah, fascinating job. Did anybody fuck in the back? No. You never caught that? Never caught that. Did you get laid off it? No. Some people did. You know, I think some people did. I never got laid off it. It's got to be a matter of how much you work it, right? It's probably a matter of how much you work it. I mean, I was like, you know, I didn't keep in touch with anyone that was ever on my tour. A few of the people actually kept in touch with me. A few of them came to road gigs that I did. And they really? would, I would, yeah, and they would, in the middle of the show, I'd be doing like crowd work. And they'd be like, we saw you on that tour bus. I'd be like, really? Uh, so some of them, city. yeah, some of them would go find you on Facebook and stuff. But I mean, if you were a straight dude who, I know dudes who did, like who would meet. What, meet girls there? Yeah, meet some hot German chick and like make it happen. Oh, so oh yeah, yeah, it was possible. Out after the, yeah, it was possible. Dude, there's this, uh, when, and there's all these waiters in like Italy. Yeah. They hit on girls nonstop in yeah. Greece so hard. And then people are like, it's almost annoying after a while. But yeah. then you realize like, you know the reason they do that is because there's some girls who are like, I'm going to meet a, a Greek waiter. Yeah. And this thing. So they're just like, yeah. hey, what's going on? It's they're a numbers like, game. Later. Yeah. And it's like, ugh. It's a numbers it's game. Ruin the romantic idea. Most of the people on top of those tour buses, it's a, it's a horrible backbreaking. Like, it's raining, it's snowing, people are cursing at you. It's very hard. What did you do, open air? Open air, yeah. So Some people would sexually it? harass customers and get in trouble. Some dudes would be like, where are you from? Ooh, look at you, you know? And you'd be like, oh, this is. I had done the wrong way. Yeah, I, I would be like, oh, my God. You know, but a lot of the people, you know, the Europeans and stuff, would think, but every now and then somebody would get offended at a dude doing that, and then fucking they, the company would be like, all right, you cannot, you cannot say anything like that. <laughs> I would say inappropriate stuff all the time, but it wouldn't be, I, you, I, you know, I'm not sexually harassing people, but I would say, well, you know, I, I mean, I told somebody the amount of snow was the 9-11 memorial at one point, you know? Really? Yeah, because we were in traffic. It was frustrating. They're like, where is the 9-11 memorial? It's right there. It's the snow. 
You know, you could always, if you have people from Middle Eastern countries, you could always blame everything on the Jews. You have the Saudis were on the bus. I'd be like, there's a lot of traffic. And they'd be like, why some? And I'd go, Jews. And they'd go, of course. They'd look at each other. They'd be like, well, of course. Oh, yes. Now you know, sense. Saudi women, I have a joke about it. were very demure. Like, they never bothered you. The man would always speak, you know. It's nice. You know, Every not every culture is wrong. Um, <laughs> one guy said to me from Saudi Arabia, because a lot of money to tip you 50 bucks they bought me all this they bought me a nice cup of coffee they took me for pastries one day and the guy said to me because we're fine because we're fine because you know a lot of people they say everything's going on in saudi arabia because everything's fine he goes you know they're not really they're not doing anything to the people unless they're like yelling or anything and i said well that what? seems like the guy was saying but are they killing people and everything he goes they're it, just the people not that are yelling just it's the like, people that are kind of yelling and i said well that makes sense <laughs> well, well of course that you're like okay like, yeah wait. Wait, if you yell, you get... Oh, no. But the fascinating thing about the job is you would meet people from all over the world, all over this country, and you would talk to them, and then you would you would like kind of glean a perspective into like the way they saw America, the way they saw everything. New York. New York. I mean, New York changed, man. I remember when I was a kid coming in here in the 90s, and it was still kind of holding on to that grittiness. And, and you know, then after, you know, post 9-11, it became like America's city. And as soon as that happened, it it became a city where it was like, no, how do we get people from Ohio to want to come here? And it's like, oh, well, what about The Lion King? What if every fucking Broadway musical was the biggest thing? You know, was it was it was a a movie? Spider Man. Yeah. So it became a very Disney fied. This was a city that was built on like big risks and stuff. Lame now. It's a little bit lamer. There's no more risks. Everything's a sure bet. Even the best restaurants, you go to steakhouses like Del Frisco's, which Mm -hmm. is good, but it's like. Everything's serene and corporate. There's no risk. There's, you know, no, like, there's a new place I heard is good. Let's try it. Right. I Here's what New York is to me. Some people walk out of a restaurant and go, I love it. And some people go, I hate it. People hate Peter Luger's and people love it. And that's New York to me. Yeah. Not, you know, you go to Del Frisco's, you go, it was fine. That was fine. It was a serene. There's nothing to hate, but there's also nothing to love. When you go to Peter Luger's, it's this, this sawdust on the floor. It's this archaic, ancient, masculine warehouse where you get and serve some of the best food in the world but that's not going to be for everybody the waiters are gruff it's I fucking heard peter luger's that's the place my dad used to go to oh yeah but like i heard the last time i went, heard a group of people go on comics, yeah yeah they said the f- food was just not that good and maybe they switched managers or chefs well you know what it is maybe just one they're, time they're doing else. the type of volume now they're doing the type of business ari where and my uncle's a director of operations for a restaurant group in New York City that also has very big steakhouses, Smith and Walensky's and stuff like that. Uh-huh. When you're doing seven, eight hundred dinners a night and even more, what time like- I mean, listen, how much can you? I mean, listen, you're going through a lot of product, you know. And listen, I, I've eaten at Luger's, I've had great meals there, I've had meals that I would describe as okay. Uh, I've never had a bad meal, but I mean, I think like like everything else, it's, it's still steak, you know? once it becomes a brand. Then it's and no it, good anymore. It was very tough to to really manage quality. Here's what companies do. Yeah. So when you have a name, right, that is a commodity in and of itself. Yeah. You built up a name. Oh yeah. ABC News, uh, Chevy, whatever right. it is, and people think of you as this thing. Yeah. Uh, a restaurant, wine. Um, the way I was explaining to this actually is in a wine. Let's say you have, let's say you have a wine. Let's say you have right. Mondavi. Yeah. Is that no? That's a wine. Yeah, Robert Mondavi. That's a wine. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So now Robert Mondavi is my dad's known- a wine salesman. Really? Yeah, yeah. So it's known as this level of quality. Yeah. This price range, at this price range, you're going to get an A+. plus. If yeah. there's a higher price range, it's still an A-. minus. It's a really good. You're always going to get quality Mondavi wines. Right. So then Mondavi will sell, and someone else will buy it. Yeah. And they go, okay, now we have this thing where the commodity is the name and also the wine. Right. Let's change a couple of the ingredients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of going nine months of fermenting, let's go eight and a half. Right. People will still say it's quality. Even though it's a little bit worse, I'll still say it's on the same level because the right. name is still there. Right. Then we're going to sell a little more. Now we get eight months of fermenting, then seven. Yeah. And then after a while, it's just like, oh, this isn't good anymore. Yeah. But it takes so long that they're still banking off the name yeah. and saving money. Right. That you can like make this income off just losing. National Lampoon is another one. Yeah. For a while, that, that meant funny. Yeah. And they just start saying, hey, you want to say National Lampoon's? Give us 10 grand. Right. And, and they we'll made a it. shitload of money off yeah. that, and now nobody gives a fuck about National Lampoon. Well, they go to these celebrity chefs now. Where they go to them, and they go, listen, you want to you make $100 bucks? 
You know what I mean? You got to yeah. open restaurants everywhere. Yeah, have, and have then, a McDonald's line. With and then on fuck it. fine dining. Just start slinging, you know, frozen yogurt and hot dogs and whatever else. The, you know, Danielle Ballou, who's a great chef. Danielle is one of the best restaurants in the world at one point. And, uh, you know, he's got an upper, you know, upscale deli. It's nice on the Upper West Side where they're like, serve gourmet hot dogs. And he's like, okay. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. what? Because at a certain point, they do that fine dining shit. It's like comics that get into acting. Where you go, yeah, well, okay, you've, you've done it. You've packed stadiums. You know what that feels like. Now try to win an Academy Award. Yeah. So these guys are like, okay, I've cooked for the wealthiest people in the world, but now I want my McDonald's. Yeah, and then everyone calls those, those comedians when they do acting like, oh, they're so funny, they're so funny. And even yeah. when they do a non-funny role, yeah. they go, so funny. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They're not even trying to be funny. <laughs> not, yeah. Like, what? Yeah. She's doing a remake of Sophie's Choice. Yeah, yeah. so oh, funny. Yeah, yeah. She's so funny. Sophie's Choice should be called So Funny's Choice. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's piss real quick. Yeah, let's do it. Is that going? Yes, there it is. Do you ever have to f- the pee and then like you, as you fart, you're like, you can't decide if it's like. Not worth sitting down. Right. Where it's like, is that a shit or is that right. like a bubble of a fart that's yes. going to like explode? Yeah. I have that all the time. Out of the air. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have It's that, a like, shit getting shit. ready. I think maybe. That's what is preparing to be a shit. It's coming. Yeah. It's not completely unrelated. You know? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's it's, it's a, the it's propaganda an war an before, you know? Yeah. I can't decide if I want to stay with you on uh, on um, tour guide stuff or get into sales. You can do whatever you want. I know. I could talk about so much. Being a con artist enables me to really just talk. You think it's all the same shit from fucking from that? It's all the same shit from uh, from tour guide. It's just so. selling nothing. It's just selling hot air. That's all the internet is. That's all. I mean, for example, when I did sales, there was always a guy in whatever company I worked at that would be the loudest guy, who would brag and he would end up at the end of the month selling nothing. He was a horrible salesman because he thought that being a good salesman, you would just watch movies like Boiler Room and Wall Street and just and be this be hyper masculine guy that would run around and be like, "You don't know who I am. You don't know any of these people. Don't know anything about money." And then that guy would end up selling nothing. And but the reason that that guy now owns the internet in terms of like is because that's essentially like it would almost be like if one day they said one of these guys was named Howie, and it would be like the internet. I explained to people like this it would be like one day Howie had not sold anything for like eight months, and then month nine he's the top producer, and everybody went, "How the fuck did that happen?" And go, "Oh, we're not selling products anymore." You know all that hot air, you know all that shit that Howie talks all day. That's the product. That's the thing. Just yelling, getting people going, riling people up, <laughs> inciting people. No, you don't ever have to close a deal. You don't have to sell anything. You don't have to give anyone a product. There's no deals being made. The only thing is your ability to generate attention by being a lunatic is the product. He's the top guy. Dude, that's what they tell you. Everybody, they're like, they're like, just start a, a video blog every day. And they go, look at these people doing video blogs. They're making money. Right. And they're not even that good. It's like, <laughs> yeah. well, I don't want to do that then. Right. right. It's just like, I'll just yeah. keep putting sh- nothing out. Yeah. Well, that, that's what we are now. We're, it's like that clickbait culture of like, clickbait. there's nothing permanent. Yeah. Somebody's hot take on Trump's agriculture secretary nominee isn't going to be looked at as two, th- you know, in 2018 is like you watch Annie Hall or any of that. And you're like, well, it's still fucking great. Yeah. I mean, you no, know, your, your fucking blog about feminism as it relates to star Wars is probably not going to hold up. <laughs> That's probably not, but it got, it did what it, it, it angered enough people and it made enough people happy that it just gets you through that day. So it's like buying and selling. Buying and selling, nothing. like when you're a tour guide, you're just you're convincing people to open up their pocket and give you money. And the way you do that is by providing them with some type of unique experience, you know, so that people feel like, oh, I, I there was a reason that this guy did this. There was a reason that he was here today. I would be irreverent, and I would say all kinds of crazy things. And some people would tip me a lot because they'd be like, this was hilarious. Yeah. And then some people would walk out angry and be like, I, I didn't like that. And go, well, all right. Oh, your attitude, you mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, people would get angry. It's like comedy traffic school. You know, people would get angry. You know, I mean, not you know, you get on the tour bus, and not everybody really? wants to hear about satanic pedophile cults. That's what you would do? Every now and then. If I had a bad group. <laughs> You know, what do you mean? like, what would you do? They'd be like, well, what, what, you know, what about the, you know, the Dakota? We'd be talking about the building of John Lennon. I was like, Rosemary's baby. And I'd be like, 
you know, that's about a satanic cult. We all know that's true. You know, we all know. I mean, we all know that that has some link to reality. There's a lot of occultism on all kinds of levels of the government. I mean, we all know that, right? I mean, I'm not telling you guys things you don't know. I mean, Aleister Crowley. I mean, all this stuff is, I mean, these people uh, do this. Tour guide, people from yeah, Alabama. yeah. People would be sitting there in duck hunting outfits. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so they weren't thrilled. And it's also like, it would also get weirdly gay where I would talk about socialites and I'd be like, yeah, that's Jane Reitzman. She helped Jackie Kennedy decorate the White House and like, you know, that chick came out. You know, one one uh, great example was, you know, downtown they're having the gay pride parade. So a bunch of people got on my tour bus and they were like, you know, Texas fucking people or whatever in Alabama maybe. And they were like, downtown's a little too gay for us today. So we're going to take the uptown tour. That's what you'd say? No, that's what they would say. Oh, okay. They had no idea that the Uptown tour, I talked about socialites and Jacqueline Kennedy and, you know, all these fucking people. So, like, in the middle of I'm me. Still hitting you with a guy. Yeah, in the middle of me talking about, you know, Brooke Astor and how if you weren't at her party, you were nobody. One of the kids turned to his dad and went, this is probably gayer than the parade. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, it was like, so, but I, I, like, turned it on that day because I was like, oh, fuck you people. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, you should be. You're here from Alabama. You should see a dude's nutsack bouncing yeah, on somebody's fucking of head. Yeah. The only thing I like about the gay pride parade here, yeah. I like it in L.A. Yeah. It's because there's just no room. There's so no like room. Once you turn I love how street, you, personal like, space is a very big theme for you. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> but in L.A., it's like, all right, you're bunched up, but if you want to just back away. Yeah. Now it's like, now I got plenty of space. You're like, well, the biggest problem with the Holocaust was the lack of space. It was <laughs> too bunks. densely populated. Two a bunk, not three. Con- <laughs> it's just concentrated. <laughs> That's what the concentration is. Yeah. It's a concentration. It was con- <laughs> oh, Jesus. That's, I never thought of it like Wait, that. Is that? What is that is? why? Well, it's not because of concentrating, right? I don't. I mean, you. it was probably hard to concentrate. Probably hard. I would imagine. Actions with the shootings and stuff. Yeah. Um, concentration. I bet that's what it was. A concentration of Jews. That's amazing. Is that true? I, bet it I is. don't know if that's true. This is, this is amazing. I could look it up. My computer's in the other room. Uh, let's just say that's what it is, and just yeah. go on. Because that's the we're now living in that world. We're like that's just our truth. Yeah, sure. That's real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Put it in print. It's as true as anything. Yeah. What's objective truth in this world that we live in now? It's like ah, oh, fuck it. I like intentionally saying things wrong sometimes. People, you know, I've gotten stupid questions. People would be like, does John Lennon still live in the Dakota? Somebody said that. Really? Yeah. In a serious way? Not joking? Not joking. Uh, do you ever, are you ever like wanting to go, yes? No, I said yes. I said, year. yeah, of course he does. Yes. You know? I mean, you never answer a stupid question with a good answer. Ever. I mean, you know, people with people, but then you realize how people don't understand money or life. Because I'd ask a guy, like, the most expensive apartment in New York is about 100 million bucks, you know? Yeah. But I'd be like, well, what's the most expensive apartment in New York? And some guy would be like, I don't know, one billion? And you're like, dude, do you have any idea? <laughs> one guy was like, five billion? I'm like, do you know, like, do you even know? Or is everything, everything over. Thirty dollars is like monopoly money. The same to you. You're just it's the ridiculous. same. Like, and then people would be like, "Well, I don't understand. You could get, you know, four thousand square feet where I live for thirty dollars or whatever it is. Why would anyone want to live on Fifth Avenue?" And I'm like, "How do I start explaining civilization yeah. to you? Don't you understand? Yeah, you where don't. do I start? The wheel? Like, how far do we have to go back? Yeah, people tend to like to live in proximity to wealth and power." You I'm moron! To, I'm trying to point out, I mean, Bert Kreischer got into a discussion about, yeah. about uh, real estate, and I, I yeah. don't think you should have to go into debt to the banks. It's right? Just like if you have enough money, add on, add on. Yeah. But if you don't, then right. Don't fucking start a relationship sure. with them. Yeah. Doubling how much you owe them over the thirty. Years. Right. Um, and then somebody was like, he was coming back and forth, I was trying to understand it. Eventually, he's like, well, yeah. "This is why you pay the same amount in rent as Bert pays in mortgage." And I'm like. Yeah, but Bert lives in a fucking house. Yeah, yeah. he's not in the East Village of Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. If I had this apartment in his neighborhood, yeah, 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 yeah. Like a quarter of what he paid. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's all relative. But it's funny, like people have a lack of understanding because a lot of people, their lives are just go. Well, I just go to my job that I kind of hate. I come right. home, I watch Netflix, yeah. I fuck if I'm lucky. You know, I eat some cookie dough ice cream. I go to bed and to explain to those people why all of these people live stacked on top of each other to climb a ladder to a distant and, and possibly, you know, like, you know, future. right. Future that may not exist. Yeah. 
to explain that to them because people get very threatened. You know, you go down, you go in these wealthy areas and you go, this costs this, this costs this, you know, 10 million, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, you know, Summer Hampton's rental, 400,000, you know, for two months, you know, and it, so people start to get really like, they start to shift in their seats to get really uncomfortable because I'm like, yeah, this is fucking, this is the, super wealth. this is super wealth. You don't like it. I would punch the numbers. I'd see people getting angry and be like, oh no, I'd be like 20 million. Really? Twenty-five million. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'd like a crazy fucking auctioneer. I'd be like, there was a bathtub airlifted in there, eighteen thousand, and people would get disgusted by the end of it. But I thought it was great. Eighteen thousand, my whole place got eighteen thousand. Yeah, I thought it was a lot of fun. People get really disgusted. They're like, this, you're you're making it sound like New York's all about money. I'm like, it is, you stupid fuck. Wall Street. Yeah, it has been since 1626. It was founded as a marketplace. It was not founded by a bunch of people who gave a shit about fucking politics. It was a fur trading outpost on the East River. Give a fuck. So like, I used to think it was funny. <laughs> and you have all these Republicans that love capitalism, but they don't understand what it is. Like, They don't get what globalism is. These fuckers that live in these, they're not patriots. They see America as a market to make money. But they've got houses all over the world. And all these people would get on the bus and they'd be like, you know, they'd be like, oh, pro capitalism, pro this, pro that. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But understand what a free market is. That's a guy taking his money out of this country and putting it in China if he wants, if it benefits him. Cheaper labor there, we'll do it there. That's what it is. And a lot of. It's like getting cheaper warehouse in Delaware than Philadelphia. And go to Delaware. And a lot of people don't get what that is. And I think the Trump victory some of it was people figuring that out going oh shit like we have been sold out i saw something just saw it on yeah. tv in the background yeah some guy saying some, you know what right saying and it's just said on the bottom of the screen if the iphone was built here in america it would cost it could cost twice as much right so i don't know what he was saying but it probably yeah that. um and then i was like well yeah i mean they're the most profitable company in the world you can yeah you can be a little less profitable. And right. Maybe charge the same amount. Yeah. And I mean, what's but the also, other like, thing? What are you saying? You're saying we can, sp- we can spend less money on basic human income yeah. in other countries? But yeah. We couldn't do that here? But it's also like, wasn't that the argument for slavery? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if this building was built by people that, you know, had their own autonomy and could decide whether they wanted to work here or not, it would cost twice as much. Well, yeah, guess what? And here's the other thing. And like, I don't want phones to be more expensive, but- the iPhone is like cigarettes. Like, if you smoke, you smoke. Mm-hmm. Like, if you jack that price up, you're finding a way to get the phone. Right. Because that's a central... Early on, when it was 400 bucks, yeah. and people were like, people at Walmart have this? It's, yeah. I thought nobody could afford this. Like, right. It's as central to your life as any invention in the last, you know, however long. But, I mean, that's, that's right, the that's thing. Yeah. So that's why I did that tour because I said I want to be able to get people in this bus and just go crazy, say everything that I want to say. Oh, for the New York Comedy Festival. Yeah, for the New York Comedy Festival. I'm like, I just want to put well, people they signed on. Signed up for it. They signed up. I'm like, you know, I'm going to take you through, and you know, I'm I'm going to be funny. I'm going to say stupid things. I'm going to say things like, you know, if your kid goes to public school in New York, they have AIDS. You know, which I would say on my tour bus, but people would get mad. But now everyone, nobody got mad. Everyone laughed. Most people laughed. There were a few people that still signed up for a comedy toy knew what it was really and still were a little bit like oh we thought there would be a little we thought it would be a little more traditional i can understand that you and know like, i'll make jokes about these classic things right and not just like give you a new tour about where the fucking satanic rituals are right well good luck yeah. go find someone else <laughs> well that's not it so. <laughs> that's not the game yeah. but there was a lot of information like you know if you if you sat there and listen I'm going through all of this, you know, and I am talking about emerging markets and where all this new money is coming from. And, yeah. It's hilarious. And I'm, t- you know, because it's fascinating. To me, the only thing that's left in New York really is money. So I want to understand it as much as I can. And because that's where you walk around, you look at all these Kanye, you go, what is that? You walk around New York and you're looking at these things. The same way that if you're walking by CBGBs, you'd be like, what the fuck is this? Mm-hmm. What's going on here every night? So every, you're being encircled. With these glass towers, it'd be built, and it's like, where is this fucking money coming from? Who are these people? And I, so that, and then trying to understand that led me to like, oh, this is this is very interesting. You know what CBGBs is now? Like John Vervados, yeah, clothing you go store. Go there, and you're like, no yeah, way, yeah. But that's what people don't understand. You know, they get on the tour bus, they'd be like, that's where's CBGB? Statement. I'd be like, 
1986? Uh, what do you mean, where is CBGB? No one understands. You got to find your new one. You got to find the new one now. To find the new CBGB. Yeah, you got to find the new bands now. You can't, the Rolling Stones yeah. aren't doing anything new and Yeah, modern. they're done. Yeah. Dude, one of my favorite moments of the tour was Paul McCartney was playing in Times Square and a British woman from Liverpool looked at it and went, oh my God, this is so over. It was just an old haggard. Really? Yeah, because it was weird. It was just like old haggard. Not that he's not a legend, but he was just like in the middle of Times Square, and it's like it just looked so shitty. And it was all the it was a ton of people there watching him, but it was just like it was just so gross. It's not like new and modern. It was well, it was everything that it just it, it's it just didn't seem dignified in any way. Strumming a guitar in front of fucking Buca de Peppo, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, a bunch of Times Square. Yeah. Some promotion, something. But a woman was like, oh, this is over. Like, this is like, 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 let it die. I love that. I thought it was so good. Let it be. Let, let it, it be. be. Yeah, let it be. <laughs> let it be. Um, uh, I remember they played, well, you don't remember, but they played on the roof there where they just got together and, like, they played on a roof to, like, people were just walking by. Yeah. 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 And it was like, that was like gorilla. Right. Not like a plant thing in Times Square. Oh, yeah. I would, you would see all that shit in Times Square. You know, they'd get, they'd, they'd, there'd be like Yoga Day. All these people would come out and do like yoga. It's like we're the largest group of people doing yoga in one place. We're trying to break a record, and I'd be like, "What is your life?" Lameness. Yeah, I'd be like, "What is your life?" <laughs> you know what I mean? Sit down with me. Explain to me your life right now. That you even that that idea even passed go. Yeah. With anybody you knew, <laughs> if I if I, a friend of mine said, the "Listen, world. I want to do yoga in Times Square tomorrow at six a.m. with another ten thousand people." Because we're trying to break a record. I would go, what? I would say, listen, man, is everything all right? Unless you're all trying to get married and right. get some weird poison. Right. Then yeah, like, I'd be like, why? dude, what's going on? What's happening with you? Is everything okay? Because this is a massive breakdown. <laughs> this is a massive breakdown to me on the level of like, hey, I just started doing heroin. Like, I'd have the same level of concern. I'd be like, how did this happen? Where did, you know? Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, when people do stuff like that, it's like, all right. Yeah. It's not even fun. It's not even like, let's do a thriller dance. A giant no. Dance. Like, people do things to do them. Yeah. That's the other thing. People would spend all this money to visit New York and you go to fucking The Lion King. It gives a shit. Jake Johansson used to have a joke about you know? um, Hard Rock Cafe. Yeah. And he saw like a Hard Rock um, Jerusalem or something like that. Yeah. And he was like, so you went to the Holy Land. The holiest <laughs> city and the most like this connection to time almost like stopped since yeah. you're 1000 BC and yeah. and you got the chicken club right <laughs> it is much better to get blown up in a discotheque like it's still better even if you know what i mean like discotheque even if you got to leave with one less limb i love calling them discotheque i do too i don't know why but i mean but that's the thing you realize that you're like oh new york is just a different place now than it was yeah i mean yeah it's different than it was it's still pretty fucking cool oh Hundred percent. Kind of like oh, a hundred percent. Here, I mean, when Listen, I'm in this dude. neighborhood, especially when it's warm, yeah. it's like wow, everybody's out. Oh, you know, you listen. There's, you'll never have a city. I think you know. Listen, New York in, in history and what it means, and you can't just wash that off. Mm -hmm. It's still here. The the you know the the, the population, the people, it, it's still a lively, uh, you know, city that people. It just scares me the sameness. That's kind of creeping in to the architecture. It's cool to go down. A Sameness, but there's a Nordstrom somewhere near, near the yeah. south of New York, and a Seven Eleven yeah. popping up everywhere, and it's like Chase Bank, Dwayne Reed, yeah, over and over. The Valley in L.A., where it's like, yeah, it's lame. It's supposed to be lame. Yeah, it's fine. But like here, you want like the bodegas. Give it the life. Give it some type of unique feeling. I love walking in a bodega and a couple of crazy people sitting on the fucking milk crates. Yeah, and yeah. hanging out, talking. Cat. Why is there a cat here? Otherwise, yeah. we'll have rats. Yeah. All right, I guess. All right, cat. great. You know, but the people that are moving here now are the people that necessarily don't value those things. They're just kind of moving the suburbs in. You know. Mm. They're moving the suburb mentality. You know, the suburb, the suburbs are not are, are are geographic, but they're also a mentality. Yeah. Nine to five, go home, go to the gym, watch House of Cards, go to bed. One time, I convinced Bobby Lee. I used to lie a lot. Yeah. For fun. Yes. And so I convinced uh, Bobby Lee and Aaron Cater that I was moving back home and quitting. Yeah. I got me a job, um, so I'm going to take it. And they're like, "Why? What do you? I mean, I was five years in." Maybe around where you are now or something yeah. like that. Maybe a little less, a little more, wherever it was. 
And but I was doing well, you know. Right. I'm like no, don't. I'm like I don't know, man. I just like and I just named everything that I didn't want to go home for. Yeah. And that is the reasons I was going home. Yeah. I was like it's just like dude, softball on Thursdays, <laughs> happy hour Wednesday. Yeah. Like it's just like you know. I, want I love that. Sonic. Yeah, I just want that life. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. And then Bobby like I'm I'm buying you dinner on your way out, and I was like oh no no I, like I didn't want to get any money out of it. So yeah yeah. Like, this is right. And then I was going home for like two weeks or something anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I just said. And I came back and I was like, hey, like what? Yeah. Are you back? I'm yeah. Like, back. Oh, yeah. No, I was lying. That's hilarious. I love that. So how'd you go from tour guiding into, into sales then? No, I mean, so tour guide was the end. I was in sales before. Sales oh, was my life. Like, I mean, just, you know, because that when you don't have a, I was in this community college in Long Island and. LICC? Was, uh, NASA Community College. I've heard of that one. Yeah, I like how you have one ready, though. <laughs> you, like, dated some chick from there. Um, and I met a dude who was on my debate team, and his name was Kenny, and he was, like, a, he kind of a slick guy, you know. He, was, he had drove a, a Range Rover, and it was like, oh, this yeah. is cool. This dude's cool, you know? And I'm like, how, did you, how do you have a Range Rover? And he came from, like, a regular middle-class house. I'm like, how do you... And, that. Yeah, and he's like, well, I work at a mortgage bank. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? He's like, I sell mortgages. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he's like, that's what everybody's doing now. And it's true. Selling mortgages. Yeah, this was 2005, okay, 2000, 2004. He started selling mortgages in 2004? Yeah. So he was... He was <laughs> How did that work out? Great. For a little bit. For, for, for a while, you know? So we started working. So I, I went. So he brought me after uh, after debate team. He's like, you're a great talker. Let me just bring you to this thing. So I walked into this office, you know, on Sunrise Highway in Long Island. It was all these young guys in suits, on phones, telemarketing. And then there were little offices clustered uh, along the side. Real boiler room stuff? Uh, yeah, kind of. It looked very boiler room-esque. Yeah. But that's... It, it, that, okay. It's almost like how every office, every office kind of looks, every sales office, if you've ever been in a sales office. Everyone it, on phones. Everyone's on phones. It, 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 there's a liveliness. There's an energy. You know, so I walked in and, um, you know, I, I walked in and they, they put me on a phone immediately. They're like, just, t- just call this guy. You t- ask him if he wants to refinance the mortgage he has. You'll get him a lower rate. You'll save him money every month. I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, tell him you're, you know, you're a financial advisor. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, I'm, what? Like, I'm stoned. Like, we smoked a blunt in the Range Rover on the way here. I've never done this before. I'm not a financial advisor. But I was able, like, I called the guy, and there's, there's all these guys were listening to me, and the guy picked up the phone, and he gave me a couple of objections. He's like, yeah, I deal with Chase Manhattan. And then I kind of I kind of beat him back by being like, you know how big of a bank Chase is? You know how many millions of employees, you know, thousands of employees they have? I was like, you really want to trust those people? You know, do you know how many how many approvals you have to, or do you have how many rooms? That and then the guy start something somewhere started to make sense to the guy. He's like, yeah, you're right. I'm like, oh, I'm a small thing. I'll come out. I'll sit down. And everyone in the room was like, you're you're gonna. This is it. You're, wow. This is you. Because They're like, you could convince them. Yeah, they were like, no, this is what you're meant to do. They're like, you're meant to be on the phone and convincing people, opening deals and closing them, and like you're you're meant to be that guy. And I'm like, I didn't even know. But you know, growing up in Long Island, you become obsessed with money from a young age. Because Long Island is garbage. It is. A lot of it is. Some of it is. Some of it's not. It's that money thing, and it's like you know, it's like oh, I'm a con- I own my own contracting company. And it's yeah, like, that's your success level. It's just like uh, yeah, but you know what it is. What are they going to do? What are those people going to do? What are they going to be? You know what I mean? What's that guy going to be? The in the Peace Corps? Like you're saying, they have no like they have no like desires for any sort of artistic expression or any sort of like, yeah. But dude, so many people don't. Most people don't. Most people the fucking open mic don't. They just want to be hugged. Uh, and it's like the, I look at I go run open mics in New York City and go you should have a contracting company like you at least should have uh, no but Long Island you become very uh, aware and it is there's a lot of garbage you know people out there and you become very aware of like oh you got a pool you got a, this car you have a lot of money in Long Island money your success level is determined very much by money. So like the idea of like, oh, I could work here, I could work in this job and I could earn a lot of money, you know, and, and, and sell things. That could be, but, the, but the whole thing is that now I'm in like this environment that's completely crazy. Mm-hmm. I'm around drug addicts, you know, two or three of the people, two people OD'd in, within the two years of working for that company. Two people OD'd on drugs. Oh, really? I was at two funerals. The guy that I was working for was 24 years old. He was making $100,000 a month. A month? He got into the business because his attorney told him when he got caught with ecstasy, I cannot get you out of another drug charge. You have to sell something else. 
And he goes, what? And he goes, maybe mortgages. He was already a drug dealer? He was a drug dealer. And the guy said- Drug dealer making 100 grand a month? Or- no, mortgages were 100 grand a month. Wow. Drug dealer was probably 10, 20 a month. So was, they sell something else, sell another They would sell something else. And then he went into mortgages. So he built this little empire. So I started working for them. And I was doing okay. I wasn't doing, like, I wasn't making tons and tons of money. I was, I was, I was doing a lot of drugs, doing a lot of blow. I was still 20. You know, I was 19. So I didn't really, I wasn't like, this wasn't like, I wasn't like, oh, this is my career and this is going to be my life. But it was, you know, and I, I stayed with it for a long time. And I went to a couple of different companies. And these companies were just popping up everywhere in Long Island. I mean, literally, your buddy would call you and you'd go, he'd go, I'm getting paid more here. Like, I'm getting 40% of the closing costs here. How, yeah, how do you make money? I sell you a rate. Well, there's a couple of ways to make money on a mortgage. Number one, we were brokers. So we were, in a, like, we were basically taking a bank's money, like yeah. Wells Fargo or Chase, and loaning you that money. We were taking you and your circumstance and then basically matching it with whatever loan program. And, and Chase and Wells Fargo, this is backdoor because they didn't want to lend the money to, their, you know, to walk into Chase and Wells Fargo and get a mortgage, you have to have great credit. Right. You have to have it's a down their, payment. It's their risk. It's their risk. Right. So, but they. Risk is this? Yeah. So they would basically take money, and you know, with these different type of investment vehicles that were happening at Goldman Sachs, you know, they were bundling all of these mortgages up. You know, so they, they they were basically everybody was kind of transferring risk. So you would basically lend this money. You would give the money to a company like me, and I would, uh, you know, lend it to whoever. There were no, you know, there were loans for people that wanted to state their income, which is just tell me what it is. There were loans that were no income, no asset. There was a loan called the NINOC. Listen to this. No income, no asset, no credit. And you could get a loan if you Driver's have Driver's license. What you need to get on a Greyhound bus, I'm going to give you money. Now- a Loans like, of like $100. Right. I'll give you 250000 Oh, not- that level loan. No, I'll give you a mortgage. Oh, you're saying with the same qualifications you need to get on a grant. Yeah. yeah. With the same qualifications. We had loans where you would take out a loan. It was called a pay option arm. You could choose your payment. One of them was the regular 5% 30-year fixed mortgage where you would pay the same thing back every single month. One of them was interest only where you just pay the interest. And one of them was 1%, which was like a minimum credit card payment on your mortgage. Wow. And so like just keep going up, and it would just balloon and get more, and it would be, which would be okay as long as real estate kept appreciating, it kept going up. But the minute that house value started, you know, to fall, you were fucked because now you owe five hundred and eighty thousand on a house that's appraising for four hundred and twenty. Right. So when the bank forecloses, they're losing a lot of money, and that's how the whole thing started. But so I would make money by giving you sitting down with you, and going, Ari, you look like a nice guy. You're buying a house in L.A. You're very successful. You know, you're comedy. You got a couple of shows. You know, everything's great. We're a big fan of you and everything you'd sit down with me and you go okay and i would go you know we could we could probably do like you know f- you know four and a half or something like that and you go hey listen i'm gonna be honest like you know my friends are getting four and an eighth or four percent you know i mean you sound like you're a little higher out of the market i go well listen well it, we, we might be able to get you that but we got to get moving today immediately so basically i sell you on four percent like that's what well, you know, i kind of sell you on that now i have two ways to make money i gotta i gotta tell you well here's what four percent costs you in closing costs, in points. You gotta pay a point. A point is a percentage of the loan amount. I can get you 4%, but you gotta pay me a point up front. So well, hold on, $100,000 loan. 1,000 is a point. 1,000 is a point. One That's one point, one percent. So I have to pay 1% a month? No, one percent up front, fee, oh, okay, closing okay. costs. It, but again, we finance it into the loan. Okay. It's tax deductible. So now I owe 99,000 left? Right, so now, now I basically say to you, no, you don't owe 99,000, this goes on top. Oh. So I tell you, I tell you, listen, this is upfront closing costs. These are fees. I disclose them. You know what they are. We, we, we haggle, we argue, whatever. And I go, listen, this is the cost of getting it done. Your credit's probably not great. So you've already been told maybe by Wells Fargo to get the fuck out. You've already been told. You're, I have to make you understand. I mean, I'm not going you, nowhere else. Yeah, you're, this is why you're here. You know, I, I had a lot of car insurance. It cost me a lot of money. And somebody would be like, well, you've totaled five cars. And be what like, are you selling the, to the guy to take the loan? Yeah, so I'm trying to convince him to take this loan. Well, I'm telling him that you got to go with me because there's a million people that are going to do what I'm going to do. So I'm telling him, and then I want a loan. Yeah, 
he he needs one. He's already in the market. Like I need a loan. He has a house, and he goes, "I have a fucking eight percent interest rate. Everybody else around me has five percent, because rates have come down dramatically." Oh, so then, so then, so you have an eight percent interest rate, one hundred thousand dollars. Like, let me yeah. borrow one hundred thousand dollars, pay that off. Yeah, and I owe you five percent. Yeah, at oh. less. And then here's fifty grand. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about a pool? They say swimming's the best exercise. And so then, then now you owe one hundred fifty thousand. Let me ask you a question. You ever with your wife? You know, you feel oh. that you know you guys get in arguments because the house isn't that big. Why don't you add, what are you having Thanksgiving this year? Why don't you have it in a big, beautiful dining room? So, you know, people start going like, you know, oh, okay. And, uh, and you upsell them. And then, and then you can make money on the back. And the back end is like, listen, I said I was going to get you four. I'm really getting you four and a quarter. Because four and a quarter might pay you two points on the back. Depending on, rates change every single day. Pay who on the back? The, the bank. Oh. Because the bank might say, listen, rates are changing every single day. The only reason the economy is not in free fall right now is because rates are like zero. Money's free, essentially. Banks, central banks, everybody's borrowing money at no interest. Like, they're just pumping it into the economy. Say, like, interest rates going up. Is Some people say that's a sign of a bad economy. They go, no, that's a sign of a good economy. It's kind of a good economy, but it's going to doom our particular economy. Because, well, I'm, and not that it will doom us, but here's the problem. If the financial crisis happens again, which it can, and it probably, but there's just nowhere to go now. You know, rates were at zero, and it's like there's nowhere to really. No, and um, yeah. So, so essentially, you, 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 so some of these, some of these salesmen were, were, were just bad salesmen. Meaning they would try to sell the deal again at the table. So I promised you four percent, and then we get to the table. I go, listen, you know, it's four and a half. That's it. What are you going to do? We got, we're going to close today. You don't want to go through the process again. You know, I mean, and, and, and I mean, and you would see these things, and some of them would be, and people just do it. Because these people knew, it was like half of these people knew it was a scam anyway. They're like, I can't, I'm borrowing $100,000. I have not, yeah, I make nothing. Like, like we, we, you would call people and you would go, how can you show any money? The guy would be like, not really. And I'm like, do you realize your Escalade payment on your credit report is more every month than you show coming in? Wow. He's like, I figure it out. I'm like, okay. You know, we had one salesman, this guy, Doug, who was horrible. He was like 500 pounds, maybe 450 pounds. And he was like one of the slimiest guys ever. And so he would just always lose deals because he was, he was even in that era, he was one of the most dishonest people ever. And he would sit down, he'd go, hello. He'd call old ladies up and he'd go, it's Douglas Ellerman. Hello, how are you? Is this Edna? I'm going to be your boyfriend for the next week. I want you to get all your financial documents, send them in. You're going to call me. I'm available all the time, 24 hours a day. And he would do business with like these old ladies. But one family wow. came in, one family came in and, uh, they sat down and, and, and Doug went in there and like well, you could hear because this is a guy that was never honest with anybody, you know? So he would, he would, he would go in there and then like they were waiting and then all of a sudden like you, would hear, you just heard this because it was so loud. He's like, well, listen, the closing costs went up by a little bit. And we're all just like, oh my God. And he goes, by $10,000. <laughs> the whole day just got up. These people got up. They like stormed out of the office. He was like running after them. He's like, let me explain. And then like uh-huh. one of the managers actually got them back in. They ended up actually doing the deal. Really? Yeah. I mean, Wait, they had 10, to. More? Yeah. By 10, he's like, you owe 10000 But it's also like the worst salesman ever. It's like, first of all. You say percentage. You don't say the amount. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, you do. You, you're like, Let's cushion it. Cushion it. But then there were people that just outright lied. There was this guy, Howie, who was a lunatic. Who would, just lied? He would lie. Like somebody would go, what's the APR? Now, the APR, so if I give you a 5% rate, yeah. but I charge you a point or two to get it, that's the cost of financing. Okay? So now that rate, when you look at the actual loan, is higher. So it's an annualized percentage rate is the real rate that you're paying with the fees that I charge you. Okay. Okay? So for a 5.5, it might be like the APR 6.125, whatever. Okay? So but if somebody asks you that, that's what you got to say. It's like, it's, this is the cost of doing the loan, add it into the rate. Howie said this. He goes, oh, that's the average person rate. What? <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. That's the average person rate. You're better than average. So you're getting lower than that because the base no rate was always lower than the APR. And like closing attorneys would call the bank I worked at and oh go, I God. cannot close loans for Howie anymore because he just will. He lies direct. The closing attorney would be like, you can't like, say you can't that. And it's like, no, but they will pay more. Right, right. And like the closing attorney was like, Howie, you can't fucking say that. And like. You know, but he, they, so, I mean, you wow. listen, they were, these were some of the most dishonest people in the entire wow. fucking world. Some of these people, these were just horrible people, Yeah. you know, but you know, some of the, but you know, at the end of the day, he and was, they didn't give a fuck. They just want to make their money. 
listen, they didn't, not only did they not give a fuck, but nobody knew what was coming, I think, in the way that it was coming. The, the collapse. Yeah, people didn't know that was going to happen. I don't think anybody knew that. A few guys did. So like, it's no, but, fun, and now everybody kind of Monday morning quarterbacks. Like, obviously, and, it was going to happen, but like, was not obvious. You're saying? Or I mean, like, not. No, I don't think it was. I, I don't think anybody thought that. I mean, I think some people did, but I was a 22 year old kid on blow, and I was like, yeah, I guess these mortgages are kind of weird. But I guess, I mean, I had no idea that the state of California's pension plans were invested in junk mortgage. You know what I mean? I had no idea how interconnected everything was. Whereas like this would be a tsunami that could bring down the entire financial system. I didn't know. Literally this, I took a mortgage myself at 22. I gave myself the same mortgage that I'd given to everyone else. I bought a $600,000 house when I was 22. What? I rented out the top of it to a minister and his wife. And I fucking tried to make a go of it. My mortgage was $4,400 every month. And they paid you know, rent of like 1800 and then I paid the rest of it and fucking, you know, I mean, obviously it didn't work out, but I, I would never have done that had I thought, like I had no idea. I thought that you would take these loans, houses would continue to appreciate and you could just fix these rates so that they would stop the bleeding. I had no idea that an entire financial collapse was going to wipe out a sector of the economy at people's, and I mean, literally, literally wiped out. sector of the economy. I mean, you know, real estate, housing, all of that stuff. No one for a while. I mean, everybody was fucked. You know, in Long Island, we had all these trucker delis that would serve bacon, egg, and cheeses. And then all of a sudden, in 2007, these fuckers started opening up these fancy, like, you know, oh, this is a pesto mayonnaise, and uh, this is a fucking, uh, and you'd be like, what? They'd be like, yeah, this is a honey pesto mayonnaise and a roasted red pepper panini. And it was like all this weird shit. And you could just see these delis becoming these huge gourmet factories, and they were just catering all these open houses and all these fucking real estate seminars and all of this shit. And those fucking things went out of business and the guy whose job it was to appraise the house and he was a slime ball and I mean because he would go in and we'd be like we need a half a million dollars for that the value of that house and the appraiser would kind of go in and he'd be like I don't know and we'd be like you, what do you, mean? He, you need him to say it's worth we half need you to say it's worth half a million he's like it's kind of hard why, why would be, you, what would you get out of that we would need to get the deal done you know because the guy owed four hundred thousand and you could only lend them a certain percentage. So we'd be like, it needs to be worth five. Can't be worth four twenty. So these, I mean, we had another guy. This guy, this appraiser, was just this fat guy. He would drive around and drink coffee and smoke cigarettes. I don't know where he is. He might be dead. But he would just, and he would be like, all right, you know, we tried to do what we can. And so these appraisers, that whole thing, title companies, whose fucking job, appraisers, and the appraisers just did whatever they told. They would told did whatever they, they told. Title companies who researched title on properties to see if there were any outstanding liens, they all went fucking belly. I mean, so this entire world that was created, and it came out of California, all of these big companies, a lot of these REITs, real estate investment trusts, like Countrywide and all this stuff, a lot of these were Irvine, California-based companies. Dude, I'm telling you, for a while there, it was like you had to buy a house, and yeah. you're like, well, I can't afford it. Like, if you don't buy it now... In four months, it's going to be worth <laughs> twice as much. Yeah, yeah. So I know you can't. And they were it, right. Really, when I'll be able to. And you're like, oh fuck. And you right. have this need to like. I mean, I have a to buy. Up, maybe, maybe I have to do it. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, boom, boom, boom. And you, boom. dude, you were buying without any money down. You know, forever you would buy a house with ten to twenty percent down. Now it was a hundred and six percent financing, meaning they would finance the closing costs. You didn't have to put any Maybe money into than, the deal than, than the house cost more than the house cost you didn't have to put any money into the deal and so you had you had very little skin in the game and they gave you one of these mortgages and like as a as a young dude at 22 23 years old you didn't now when i look back and i go i'm now i'm 30 and i'm like oh okay i, I see why this all went crazy but back then you're just caught up in the, in the in the craziness of like and and listen these are not all people they're like people go oh there's a lot of predatory lending i'm sure there was Hundred percent. There was a lot of fucking greedy people that shouldn't have had money that wanted money. Right. There were greedy people that go, you know, no, no, I want money. Get the deal. Get the loan. They would call you every day, like, how can we get? What can I do? I'll have my cousin say I work there on the weekends. Because no one told them, like, listen, no matter what, you can't. Yeah, You're no, no, here. nobody said that. So, like, and listen, there was predatory stuff. I do feel like What's I predatory. Stuff? Predatory means you prey on people in desperate situations. You know. But I think a lot of it was like the majority of people that I sold mortgages to were middle class Long Island people. That's where my mortgages were. I heard was like they were lied to by think people they thought was going to be knew the system. Yeah. So they were like, All right, now I, I did, don't think I can afford this. I did some business in can. the city in Brooklyn, but a minimal amount. The majority I did was in Long Island. And it was couples. And it was fucking people that lived in Long Island, lived in regular houses. And they're like, yeah, we want, a, we want more money. We want more. 
and we can't afford it. Our lifestyle does not support our lifestyle. So we were, we were the conduit. We were able to do it. And you would work in these crazy companies where the, the guy who runs the place is 25 and he's in a fucking Aston Martin or whatever. And, you know, it was great. You'd be doing blow and you'd all be at a little, you'd go to strip clubs, you'd be in a little bit, you know. It was this really wild world where I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. But then when it came down and I remember it kind of coming down, I remember sitting in a room in 2000. And uh, seven, when this stuff, you know, the New York Times ran an article on the front page, it said mortgage meltdown. And these subprime banks, these banks that catered to borrowers that didn't have good credit, started to evaporate. They started and, and you know, and these banks had thousands of employees. And all of a sudden it was like out of work, all- out of work, out of work. And I remember our bank, we worked for a bank called Accredited Home Lenders. And they were, you know, supposedly one of the better banks. Their portfolio was better. And Jim Cramer came out and he's like, Accredited's got a good portfolio. Portfolio, they're fine. The next day after he said that, they ceased U.S. operations. Really? And we, yeah, we had a thought of the day every day. You know, when you work at a sales company, you have these shitty thoughts of the day where you're like, you know, uh, the, the mountain is uh, only as high as you. It's like, okay, dude. But that yeah, thought of the, really yeah, that thought of the day was like, good luck. Oh. You know, and I, I knew dudes who were making forty thousand dollars a month who now, you know, who who for a while delivered pizza at the fucking pizzeria. Yeah, because it was shot. They were done. There was nothing for them to do. And they literally, you know, the whole Range Rover, the whole industry went under. People's lives. I mean, adults, grown up. I heard a yeah. thing on the radio was saying, there was two people talking. One was like, we got to find a way. This was 2008, 2009. We got to yeah. find a way to get these families back into their homes. And the other guy was like, no, no, no. These families never should have been in houses. Yeah, no, it was bad. We need to get them back into apartments where they should have been. Yeah, yeah. No, listen, I, I bought a house. I know. I, I a house at 22. I bought a house at 22 for half a million dollars. You got it? No. You sold it. Yeah. Wells Fargo called. They're like, they, I'm like, listen, you gotta. I said, this, this, you know. I was like, I was like, I was like, congratulations. They're like, on what? I'm like, on the purchase of your home. You know, keys are on the table. Like, I can't. You know, I was at a, the bank that I worked for went out of business. It just yeah. evaporated. Done. Then I worked for another bank. But you, you, you know, you. At the end of the day, it's like the you know you start beating. It. And I was also starting to sober up. I was like, all right, now it's time to fucking move on in my life. Mm-hmm. How but, much coke was there? A lot. It was, it was a, lot. <laughs> a lot. It was a good amount. I mean, it's probably at work. Coke? Yeah, oh yeah, on the desk. I mean, it was oh on the desk while you're talking to clients on the phone. It, you know, I, you'd walk out to a line, come back in, and be like, "All right, listen. So here's the deal. What? This is what we're talking about. And we're talking about a lot of things, but let's talk about what we're talking about. You know, <laughs> you'd be like, "Listen, I don't understand. I understand you're upset." And the wife would be like, "Hey, I wanted money. And you go, you're getting sixty grand. We know you don't deserve this." <laughs> You know, and it was like, you know, yeah, you would go out and you would fucking, you know, I mean, it was just weird time when I'm like a 23 year old kid. I'm not like an adult, but I have a suit on. I have a suit on and I'm walking around, you know, the Marriott Hotel at some real estate conference with a fucking martini being like, well, you know, the trends are look like they're converging on. And it's like, this is insane. Yeah. It's insane. You know, it's just insanity. You know, just it, saying whatever sounds right to you're just a scam artist. Yeah, pretty much. well. You know, listen, it's that's the whole world. That's the whole. I mean, I know artists. We tend to think that we're you know or whatever like this, but but the whole. I mean, that's all that's going on now. That's all they're doing at JP now. That's all they're doing at Goldman Sachs now. That's all anybody ever does. You're not. It's not like you own a bakery and you go. You like this pie? It's a good pie, right? Come back. These guys are like. Dealing with abstracts. They're in the, the, the secondary market with like, all right, did you like that pie? All right, let's bet on that you're going to hate that pie soon. And that you're going to, you know. So at a certain point, it's like all of these fuckers are. But yeah, it was a crazy fucking world. Did you, um, oh, what was I just going to say? Fuck, I lost it. Coke, desks, drugs. Yeah, no, wait. Bet on that. Cocaine in the car. Percocet in the morning. Really? Oh, yeah. A couple of Percodoodles in the morning. Double tall, non-fat latte at Starbucks. There was never anybody like, oh, you don't do that at work. Everyone was like, you do it at work? You know, nobody would say. I think if the person who said you don't do that at work probably wouldn't be working there that long. They weren't down with the program. Do you ever feel somebody in life now trying to sell you? 
all the time. And you're like, dude, you're being too obvious. It's awful. Yeah, Stop. but I'm easily oh, sold. Let's on you. Let's tell you, you should yeah. wear that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Dude, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I'm a salesman, so salesmen are easily sold. Like I want it to work, really? and I feel for them. I feel for that person doing it. I feel for that guy trying to sell comedy tickets at fucking Times Square. Really? I feel for these fuckers, dude. And after, listen, when I started comedy, I still wanted to do sales because I didn't know how to do anything else. So I went to go sell copiers in Staten Island, and now that's tragic because there's just no money. Why? Because compared, compared to what you're making before, or yeah, dude. I mean, listen, the top guys at the company are making 200 grand a year. Now, the top guys at the mortgages are making that a month. Wow. So, so just by comparison, yeah. Terrible. So I'm telemarketing, trying to sell fucking copiers over the phone. This lady who sits next to me named Ida, she's like, I'm the top producer here. Really? I said, Well, what's your goal? She goes, If I keep doing good, I'm gonna get a car. Wow. I said, Well, this different. is way different. Tragic. And that'd be a tragic by comparison. What? It's only tragic by comparison. It's any any grown up whose goal, main goal is a car is it's very sad. But it is tragic by comparison. You're right. Stanhope did a bit for a while ago. It's not a lepo bad. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, he but, did a bit about how these uh, NFL athletes, you know, they've gone broke. And yeah. One guy was a, was a starting quarterback for five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thousand dollars to his name. Right. And everyone's like, oh fuck. Right, and but it's Stanhope's thing yeah. Is, uh, you know, most people don't have fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah. Most <laughs> yeah. Most people have like two thousand in the bank. Maybe. Yeah, goes, You're doing great. Yeah. Get a job like you should yeah. have gotten from the beginning if football wasn't elevated yeah. to crazy status. Yeah. And now you're way ahead of the game. Yeah. You it, had an amazing seven years. <laughs> yeah, yeah you'd be lucky. Doing blow off fucking hookers pussies. So fucking lucky. And now you have 15 grand to start with? Now go work at Walmart. Yeah. I mean, it was sitting in that sales office in Staten Island was rough. It was bad. It was sad. I mean, it was sad because the people there... You know, telemarketing, trying to sell copiers. It was just people that had really. And then, yeah, you couldn't. Could you not use the sales techniques then and push people into buying? Or no, uh, I mean, it was just very hard to get anybody to, to do anything. And I mean, at the end of the day, listen, every sales office has a lot of desperate people. There's always a guy who like has had his second DW, yeah. like an older guy who's like there, who's like gets dropped off by his kid or oh. something. Oh. That that's it. It takes the bus and stuff. Oh. There's always like the fucking guy that truly believes that he's gonna be Gordon Gecko if he just fucking figures out how to sell this printer. Uh, you know, it's just a lot of desperate people because you gotta realize these jobs don't require a college degree. They don't require anything. There's no barrier of entry, just like comedy. So essentially, people are like, yeah, you're personable. You could talk. Well, this is America. You want to be a millionaire? Go and sell this copy, yeah, and we'll you, do it. you, you end it. up calling people, and they're like, hello? Like in and the I'm, mail room to the to yeah. the head, you know. Dude, I used off. to try to sell copiers in the fucking Diamond District in New York to these Israelis who would sit there with an Uzi on their desk and fucking be like, what? And like in the background, there's guys in hazmat suits like cutting diamonds, and I'm like, uh, you, I, can, I can do the lease for like 600 a month. No, no, my friend, I get the 200 a month. And I'm like... You're not get, yeah, but those uh -huh. guys don't. Those guys wanted to win every argument, and they did, and they didn't care. They would buy shitty stuff to just win every. Like they, you would never win the argument. So it would just be like, all right, if you didn't give it to them for free, they would never buy. But that no. was my my territory was like the Diamond District. So I'd be trying to sell like these fucking Eastern Europeans. Selling fucking Canon copiers. It's not. It's not. Or Indians are worse. Indians are my reward. Oh, my friend, they will stay on the phone with you for an hour. And then I would make up a rate I knew I couldn't get. Somebody would be like, I get 3%. No, I get two, my friend. I go, you're not so getting you two. Let them talk you down. Great hagglers. Well, they come from cultures with haggling. They come from cultures with big open yeah, air trained, markets they're... and haggling. They have that muscle. Americans do not have a haggling muscle. Remember The Lone Survivor, that movie? Yeah. So remember when uh, so they let the kid go and his yeah. dad? And the kid immediately starts fucking running down this fucking mountain with the flip flops on, right? Just like taking yes. two boulders at a time, yes. and they're like in their army fatigues, yeah. Train, and they're like, okay, I think I got this step, yeah, 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 this yeah, step. yeah. And like well, that guy grew up on the mountain, yeah. That guy knows the deal, that. yeah. That's you grew up haggling, yeah. You just, you grew up haggling, you grew up being like, no, nah, I don't think this is worth that. <laughs> I don't, and they know what it is. I think Americans, we put so much trust in stuff. This is the price? This is the price? And and then you listen. Not everybody goes for it, but a lot of people go, okay. And I think Americans also... We'll just say, like, that's too much, no thanks, or, okay, I can afford you that. Know, you know who did really well with the mortgage? I know people that made millions in the mortgage thing, and a lot of them were West Indians. A lot of the women... Really? For, yeah, because let me tell you why. They understood... They didn't go into debt because they said, we don't come from a system with credit. Like, we come from the system where if you don't have the money, you don't buy it. Right. There's no layaway. It doesn't exist. It's not a thing. We just... 
We don't do it. So you'd have a registered nurse buy a house when she had a 20% down payment, take a fixed rate, and then fucking sell it and retire or leave it to her kids and like, yeah. And it's like, well, why didn't she lose that house? And she didn't take all these mortgages because she was like, some guy would come in and go, hey, you know, you could take a home equity line for 100000 and like fix up the house. She'd go, why? Go, well, you could get a new kitchen. Why? I have a kitchen. You know? But you go to Long Island, you go, you could get a new kitchen. I could be in fucking business with this bank for 30 years. Yeah. Over a new fucking Right. But you go to Long Island, you go, hey, you could have a new kitchen. They go, well, what what about a bathroom? Can we do a new bathroom? Because people are going to stay overnight. They're going to use the bathroom. So if you come from that culture of... I want it, and I'll figure it out later, which is the, very much the American culture. It's our entire economy. We'll figure it out later. You know, we got $20 trillion in debt. We'll figure it out. God, and they're borrowing more money from that. And it's like, well, yeah, let's, let's, it's let's not increase real. the spending limit. It's not what? even real. If we don't increase the spending limit, we're going to default. Trump like, wants a trillion please. in infrastructure spending, which is probably not even a bad idea. It would put a lot of people to work. But, I mean, just... I mean, there's got to be a limit to all of this. I mean, the Fed chairman, I think, even told him, like, listen, there's a limit to this shit. I mean, it all comes due. Yeah. That's what happened with the mortgage crisis. It all comes due. I love bargaining when you get to, like, I bought beds when I was here. I mean, my roommate, yeah. my roommate yeah. came. So we were like, let's go look for the best price. Right. We didn't know about haggling or whatever. Right. But beds, that's another thing where it's like they're selling as much as they can to get. They buy it from a, a manufacturer for whatever. Yeah. They sell it for whatever more, like cars. Yeah. yeah. You know, they can come down. They can come down. Yeah, that's why they have a no haggling prices now on, on cars sometimes. We're like, here's just the price. We don't want you to even buy. Yeah, I'm such a bad like I'm I'm bad at haggling. Yeah. I'm just not that's not my thing. I'm decent at selling people things. I'm not great because I don't shut up. That's the problem. Good salesmen shut up and they listen. And then they find the weakness. They can isolate the person and then they go, All right, now I know why you're not doing this and I'm gonna convince you to do it. Yeah. I would just keep talking. I'd be like, wait, aren't I funny? Aren't I charming? Don't you want to just do this because I'm here? Yeah. People be like, no, <laughs> no, leave our house. You know, I'd be sweating at their kitchen table, just talking about the JFK assassination. They'd be like, when are you getting to the mortgage that you're selling us? I'm like, I right, listen, it's gonna be, I don't know, two grand a month. You can handle that, right? I mean, they're saying that the CIA wasn't involved. We know what. Like, people were like, you know, so. Get you out of here. And my manager says the same thing when we go into pitch shows. He goes, just shut up. He goes, you pitched eight ideas. He's like, they like the first, second, third. He goes, they like all of them, but he's like, you didn't need to go in there with eight ideas. Yeah. I don't know when to fucking just. Yeah. So when I'm haggling, I reveal my weaknesses immediately. Right away. Well, you right away. I'm like, listen, I'll spend fifteen hundred. <laughs> You're I'll like, spend five hundred bucks. Here's my range. We'll be like, range. Yeah, we're just here in the top. <laughs> yeah. End. yeah. I never feel. I'm never the guy that feels like he's gonna walk out. Really? I do because it, it, it depends. But I don't buy anything either. Like I don't buy a lot. But if I go to buy a bed, I just go. All right, I'm buying this bed right now. I don't want the aggravate. They know that I'm not going to go for the next week and look at beds. They know I hate. They could tell by me they standing. Tell, like, the they could tell. They go, listen, you're in PC Richards. What are you going to fucking do? Yeah, you're going to get a three hundred dollar better deal if you spend time researching this. You're not going to fucking yeah. research this. You're going to go home and go on YouTube and look at photos of the Boston Marathon bombing to see if the fucking guy who lost his leg was a fucking actor and a fucking plant. And you're going to sit up till one a.m. <laughs> doing that. You're not researching fucking beds and how to get a better bed. That's not you. Well, I can tell. We, yeah, what we did was we went. Shit. Sorry. We went to it's a not place. Not to roll your mail. That's all right. Those are all fucking. Baseball cards, I think. This is like my this is my sales strategy. I just start picking up all your. I'm like, well, this is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I go to we go to one place and there was like, how much is this, these two matches? Like uh, six hundred each. Like, okay, cool. Um, awesome. Wrote it down. Thank you. We're gonna check out a uh, Sealy, Prussia But yeah. now we know. And the guy's like, oh well, I mean, I I could do five. We're like, oh okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to know. Okay, well, we're gonna go yeah. to Sealy. And like, okay, you go to Sealy. They're like six. Like, oh okay, well, they are told over there. It's five. He goes, well, okay, I can do four fifty. And you're like, nope. Okay. Wow. That's yeah. That's good. Um, yeah, I got this third place, but yeah. All right, four fifty, and then you do that, and you go back to the first place, and they're like, he's like, you. So you want that five? And you're like, no, we got it for four, two places later. Yeah. And he goes, I can go three fifty, and by wow. the end they're like, fine, it's this, but no delivery, and then they right. get mad at you. Well, because you've beaten them out of their money. Right, but you're not even so trying. good. It's so like a it's good, like so available. So a good salesman goes like this: Have a good day. Good luck. Yeah. Have a good day. Great. Do the four fifty. See that it doesn't get delivered, that you have no warranty, that nothing works, that it's fucking garbage. Good luck. Good. Do that. 
yeah. great and I've watched really good sales guys and I'm fascinated by it because it's a muscle that like I want to have and don't yeah. you know what I mean but I, I can kind of have it that, yeah. but I want to have that muscle of be cool negotiator I've seen him there's a moment in every sale when there's a silence and whoever talks first loses you put everything on the table you go yeah. okay we can do it all 450 silent and I stare at you Aria could be for a fucking hour it doesn't matter but like Basically, I've said everything I have to say. Now, if you talk first, and you're like, all right, but let me understand one more thing. Then, of course, you can answer what they – but if they talk in that moment and they're like, they're right, that means that they're now biting. You're a fish is biting. But if you talk, if you go like this, all right, I'll throw in this. Yeah. They go, oh, weakness. Ooh, Ooh you – oh, yeah. right. Now they smell blood in the water. Oh, what else will you throw in? So good salesmen are, are confident. Yeah. They, I had one. I was trying to lease a car. Yeah. And um and uh I wanted to put as little money down as put as little as possible in the yeah. car. You know, I have a lot of money. Yeah. But um, I got to a place and they're like, cool. Do you want it? I was like, all right, yeah, I'm gonna go check out this Chevy. Chevy, whatever. It's, yeah. And like, oh, t- I've had people buy Chevys and it's like it falls apart. I mean, you right. leave a lot. And it's literally, literally falls right. apart. Right. The engine dropped out of dropped right. out of her car on the way home. Right. And I was like, dude, your friend bought a brand new Chevy and the engine <laughs> dropped out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's that's. Not even believable. That's yes, crazy. It's that's crazy. crazy. A brand right. new car. Right. The engine dropped. That would have been on out. the news. Yeah. Like yeah. That's you should have a newspaper so clipping. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. like, well, I'm going to check it out and see. Right. Thank you for knowing I can't trust you. Right. Thank you for. My dad, would, when he bought his Forerunner, he went, kept going from different places to different places, getting right. lower and lower prices. Yeah. Finally, like, fine. Take this. It's fucking this price. They make nothing. And my dad's, like, they're angry at him. Yeah. 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 Because he, like, he won. Yeah. And at the end, he goes, I also want a Toyota hat. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing it's like a sales is a battle and, and, and when you win and that's the thing with like there are people that are just like terminal shoppers that just want to talk to people yeah. they just like the idea of talking to people so they'll just call oh, a bunch of places yeah they like they have nothing to do oh. it's the same people that go around to open so houses that with mortgages oh yeah you would just people be lonely open house people they would start talking about the kids in the middle of the deal and you'd be like wait a minute do you want fucking alone and they'd be like well you know Tommy's uh, in a school play he's really good yeah I'm not just saying that because I'm his mom and I'm like Oh, you're a fucking... <laughs> you're a lonely person. You're talking to a telemarketer about your son? <gasps> this is so the sad. saddest thing ever. That is so yeah, sad. Yeah, but they're out there, dude. And then you got to be like, oh, I can't spend any time. And then you realize that like... And they'll invite you over to their house and you go there with the deal. You're all ready. You're excited. You're like, I, I, I got this fucking deal. And then you sit there and they're like, all right. And then afterwards, they like, don't sign anything. They're like, yeah, we were going to think about it. And you're like, What? And then you 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 dumbfounded in the car, and you spent like an hour with them. You had tea, and everything, and then you realize, oh, they're fucking. They've done this ten other times this week, and they're not going to do any. And then you talk to me, call them back six months later. What'd you end up doing? And they go, oh, nothing. Yeah. No, so they no. were never they were never really in the market. That's the other thing a good salesman will try to figure out who's really in the market. Like, because that, that, you know, all these hacky things in sales end up being true. Like, buyers are liars, you know, all these stupid things that people say, but they're true. It's like, you know, who's really going to buy a car and who's going to walk around for a year? What do you mean? Well, when you're, when you're a car salesman, somebody walks on the lot, you try to size them up. Is this guy going to buy or is he fucking. Is he a bus guy? You know, if you're a realtor and somebody comes in and you, you, how motivated are they? You have to gauge that level of interest because then you can't spend all your time you're with looking them. For an, looking for an apartment in Manhattan and the level of people going, it's great, it's a great apartment. You're like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like, why? What's wrong with it? Yeah. I had uh, one guy tell me that. He goes, let me, okay, let me ask you a question because you're not going to get a better deal than this. Yeah. So I want you to tell me what's <laughs> wrong with this place. Yeah. That you think you can get a better deal. I'm like, um, the bathroom's inside the bedroom, so that means anyone who's over has to go through my bedroom to use the bathroom. Right. I don't like that. I'd rather the bathroom be outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's not enough room to put a couch and a TV in here. It's just too narrow. Yeah. Um, the, the floor is a little slanted. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, I think it like, he was like, fuck, I didn't expect that to work. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the people, like a lot of the people that are really good will just not have to ask you that because they would have shut up right. and let you say that. This guy's trying would, to impress someone who's training. I forgot about that. Yeah, because he was training yeah. with them. And he was trying. To, I think oh. he was like, "Watch, watch me, how I work." Right. Watch how I talk this guy into this. But yeah. you know, here's the thing: you never talk anyone into anything. They talk themselves into it, mm. and you you basically there to kind of guide them and to apply pressure 
and there's different types of sale. There's the hard sale with stocks. You call up and go, listen, buddy, 100 grand right now. This opportunity's done. You want to fucking regret that for the rest of your life? Okay, bye. And so that you will catch some flight where people are like, okay, yeah, 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 take my money. But then there's like that soft sale with real estate where it's like they meet you, they like you, you make a couple of jokes. You're like, oh, ha, ha, ha. And, and then they're out. calling you a week later. And then, you know, fucking five months later or six months later, you know, you, you, you close a deal and you make fucking money off that couple that you've built a relationship with and now the hope is that they refer you to their friends their kids whoever all right now you got a long-term thing it's a long-term like, thing that's what good sales, that's why good salesmen can't rip people off you always go to that person for a new car every yeah. day you get a new car you're gonna go to that guy like none of these subprime mortgage guys are going back to their families like hey can you recommend me to your kids and it's like i'm living in a car it's like <laughs> i understand that but i have some business cards if you'd hand them out <laughs> when you drive around just throw them out the window like there, it's just so if you're a good salesperson, I and you know I read about all these realtors in New York and stuff. They have 20, 30 year businesses. Their book of they can sell their book of business for two million bucks. Stockbrokers can sell their book of business for several million dollars, because the amount of money that you should be able to get out of that book, that oh, that client this. list is, is 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 a ton, because they've built relationships over 20, 30 years. Wasn't that what the what's it called was all about the leads? Yeah, well, a lot of the, yeah, the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross with the leads, where it's like, yeah. these leads are gold. We're not going to give them to you. It's yeah. kind of like comedy. It's like, yeah, that eight o'clock show at fucking the cellar or whatever it is, or, you know, that fucking opening slot at yeah, fucking, we're not, we're not going to give it to you. You don't yeah. deserve it. You get to 2 a.m. at fucking whatever, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's like anything else. But the whole world, a lot of that is, and it's like, the funniest thing is when you bump into agents and managers because you're like, oh my God, I thought realtors did nothing. And then you meet some of these agents and managers, and you're like, oh, God, this is hilarious. And they're just salesmen, too. That's all they are. They're selling to, to the client and to the person the client wants to do business with. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, I, my person I uses the term the buyers. Really? Yeah. She'll be like, we're going uh, to the different buyers with I mean, you. Like network? Uh, and yes. I'm like, okay. She's like, many of our buyers like you, but they want to see some more credits. I'm like, oh, that's fair. But she explains it in a way that I can kind of understand, so I like that. Oh, they say buyers. My guy says buyers in terms of like comedy clubs. Okay, Those I think she's buyers. probably talking about the same thing. Okay. Like what, whether it's one nighters or a comedy oh, yeah, clubs yeah, or no, whatever that, it right, is. Yeah, yeah. Buyers. That's how they buyers. say Buyers. I like it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And that's what they're talking about. Buyers. And we're the fucking product. We're that Chevy that the engine hopefully doesn't fall out. So just for the last one year, wanted to send me I was in Edmonton. They want me to do the Toronto Comedy Festival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was in Edmonton. Yeah, week. so I was like, right. I can't cancel. It's a good market. I've already got yeah. my books. And they're like, well, how about Sunday? Can you come in Sunday? I was like, yeah, okay, I'll come in right. Sunday. And they're like, all right. And then they saw my flight. And they're like, oh, no, we need you to leave earlier than that. And I was leaving <laughs> at like 12 to, yeah. to get to Toronto by like 3. Right. And I was like, um, no, because if I leave at 12, like, it means I got to wake up at 9.30. Yeah. You know, 10 to get over there. Yeah. That's already pushing if I'm going to perform that night. Right. And they're like, we'd really just appreciate you got on the first flight. It's really important to us. <laughs> and I'm like. So you want me to, what do you want me to do my show in, in Edmonton and then like, and then get like three hours of sleep and then come over? And right. Like, we just be more comfortable. I'm like, you be more comfortable because you don't want me to miss my, my flight. And like, but if you missed your flight or if you, your, your flight gets canceled, we, we're not going to pay you. I'm like, yeah, obviously. Right. If I don't do the show, you don't pay me. Right. And they're like, all right, well, tell you what, we'll move your show to 11 o'clock instead of seven. And I was like, all right, well, then I'm going to take an even later flight because I'm like, right. Been more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at some point, I'm like, guys. I'm not lighting equipment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't yeah, just yeah. get me there. Right. I need to be able to perform well. Yeah. I need to be rested in a yeah. good mood. You I'm can't just person. get me there. Yeah. Well, the funny thing about Montreal is when you have the meetings with all the different people and like the way that they court you, I find very interesting. And like you that's see, that's sales like, huh? That's very sales like. You sit down with people, and some of them are like, one guy was like, "Hey, I'm from Long Island. You're from Long Island." Wow. And I'm like, what? Like, what, what do you think? I'm like, in what world like, do I? You know, I don't like a lot of people from Long <laughs> yeah. Island. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I number one, there. God, God, I would never. Like, if you were selling baked clams, I'd be like, oh, great, thank God, you know. But you're fucking, you're a mover and a shaker, and that's your move. And I'm like, all right, so we're from the same place. Like, in what world do I turn around and go, all right, let's do it. Yeah, let's do this. Statistically, what are the chances that two people in entertainment are from an island adjacent to Manhattan with nine million residents? You think some of that's just lack of training on their salesmanship parts? Where it's like, yeah, they're just bad. This should work. They're bad. They're very it's bad. Like when someone tries to interpret your dreams or actions, like that yeah. must mean you don't do this. I'm like, eh, they God, listen. Nobody in that business is working in it because Goldman Sachs said. Do you know what I mean? And they prefer not to. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody there was told by a major hedge fund. Come on in. 
A lot of people in that business. And if you're listening, I love you all. Thank you. Please continue to work for me. But some of them are great. It's just like any sales thing. There's a pinnacle. Yeah. There's an Everest. There's a thing. And, and then they, those people are more. They're visionaries. You talk to the best realtors in New York, and then the developers who are building these buildings bring in the best realtors, and they go, what do people want? Tell us. You have you know, the best fucking investment uh, you know, analysts, you know, people like that are on television. They're advising politicians because they know the, their business inside and out. But a lot of the younger people in Montreal are the guys that kind of have a little bit of luck or sign the people at the right time and they just kind of have them. Like when you hear them talk, they're like, one guy said to me, he's like, you know where I see you? Colleges. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I'm not really a college act. And he's like, nah. Colleges, you're going to be great. We're going to make you a lot of money. And I'm like, I don't know. And one guy goes, we're going to get you on the road headlining every weekend. I said, it's not possible. I have friends with twice the credits I have can't do yeah. that. So you tell that to them. Yeah, and then, It's like you, you went too far. It's like, right, I remember right. Some negotiating tactic was like, if someone gives you an offer that's not even close, <laughs> yeah. you don't say, you don't go back at them with anything. Right. You just say, see you later. Right. It's not even like a... And you should never trash your competition. Like, nobody ever... Yeah. You should never be like, oh, Chevy's kills you. It's the last yeah, lady... That's me think cars yeah, are bad. Last lady... Right. Yeah. That's a great point. The last lady who drove off the lot in a Chevy got AIDS. That's not the move. The move is Chevy's a great car. Because guess what? Then it gives them, like, nowhere to go. There's nothing like... Yeah, Chevy's a great car. Let me tell you about our car. Yeah, Chevy's great. It's really good. Let me tell you a few things that we have that are a little different... We've been able to kind of modernize a few of our things in the way that Chevy's actually kind of emulated us recently because some of the things that we've done, you go, you go, huh? Really? Yeah, that is a great restaurant. Let me tell you why this one's a little better. Yeah. You know, that one gets a little crowded. Whatever you're trying to, you know, and that's the whole thing. But you you, you don't want to be the guy who's like, and you know, I've seen, dude, I've been like, around what? a lot of bad salesmen. I've been a bad sales. Like, I know it's how like, to. So annoying and awful. I've been very desperate. I've been like not having money and needing to make a sale and being like, that bank, listen to me. <laughs> They're doing bit with terrorists. You don't know? You haven't heard? Are you nuts? <laughs> Citibank? Yeah, who's even heard of them? <laughs> and you know, these ridiculous things that don't make any sense. And the person hears that you are desperate you know you want to be willing to walk away you got to be willing to be like all right listen we we don't have to do business it doesn't make sense like that was it it was it but like with my thing i was like you gotta buy the i have an old smobile 88 it's not even it's barely running i need gas i don't have gas to get to work i have borrowed money based on this deal closing so please desperate. god you should do colleges okay. i have we yeah i should call i'm like i'm not really caught did you listen to anything that i said anything at all did you said. anything paul you know? short tried to sell me he bought a place above the comedy store yeah and uh he was like and i was living on sunset next to pink dot uh, down there on, you know, in the front of the store. No, I don't. I, that one I haven't been to. But okay. So anyway, uh, and for a long time that would have been a sweet place to live. But yeah. You know, and he goes, so dude, about this place, you're gonna live in there. And I was like, <laughs> oh, uh, what do you mean, Paulie? He goes, yeah, it's twelve hundred bucks a month. You're gonna live in there. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I, I pay a thousand now. He goes, yeah. Well, dude, it's twelve hundred. I mean, it's Sunset Strip. And I was like, I mean, I live on the Sunset Strip, I'm right? A block away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm already on the Sunset for a right. thousand. And he goes, and you want me to live with Bobby Lee, who I, at the time, hated. Right. So you want me to have a roommate, pay more, and have you as a landlord instead of a legal landlord? Yeah. No, goes, thank you. What do you want me to tell you, bro? That's a surprise. I'm like, tell me nothing. I've never expressed interest in, in, in getting this. <laughs> you're, you're not you're, Yeah. I, it's not, you're not doing your job if you're trying to sell me on this. I mean, dude, I've watched people chase people down the block chase where them. they were like, listen, they're waving papers. Like, no, you don't understand. But you don't understand. Oh, like, they were, Ew, get away. The, you could smell the bad salesman. It was like the it, p- dripping with desperation. Sure my dad a is a weird that. guy. Like, I love my dad. He's a wine salesman. Yeah. But he does this thing he doesn't even know he's doing. He, like, imitates the accent of whoever he's selling. Really? He starts to put on this weird Irish brogue that he doesn't have. He's like, oh, well, get your good price. And I'm like, you don't talk like that. And then it morphs into some weird, like he has his friend Vishnu, Vish, Vishi, he's an Indian guy. Yeah. And so my dad's like selling him wine in this package store by Central Park West. And he's like trying to, he's starting to talk like an Indian guy. I'm like, dad, like I'm in my head. I'm like, this is horribly offensive. I don't know if he knows he's doing it. He's like, we get you a oh, good price, Vishi. Oh, my God. I'm like, what uh, is this? Does it work? 
It does. I mean, people like. I think they get a kick out of him. I think they just think that's what. He's a crazy person. It's fun. He's just a crazy. Half of this shit is like, well, I got to buy from somebody. You're nuts. Like when I chose my agent, I was like, well, I got to choose someone. I don't want to choose someone in L.A. who I'll never see physically. Yeah. Who's got 20 clients that are so much bigger so than how, me? How'd you end up going with somebody besides the guy from Long Island? Well, I sat down with with this group of people, and there was like they, they, the the girl I went with, the woman flanked the table with people. It was like 10 people. And it was the best meeting out of all of them. And you know, it seemed... A lot of people interested in me. Well, they seemed... I was like, oh, well, this seems like a professional thing. They seemed... They all spoke at the right time. Nobody talked over each other. It seemed choreographed. I said, oh, well, they've at least done this. You know? Yeah. Whereas... I also like, I don't know what should go into hiring Yeah, because I don't so. really know. I just know that it shouldn't be some lunatic going, Galifianakis left me <laughs> right before. And I'm like, oh, this is fascinating. Mm-hmm. But how does this apply, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, bad salesmen are really fucking... Sad. They're sad. Sad people, dude. Like, get away from me. It's like bad comics. You ever see a bad comic? It's like, horrible. I have trouble talking to you as a friend. I thought that salesmen, were the when they were bad, were the saddest... But comics, the failed comic is much sadder. The failed lifer comic? Like oh. Somebody who's like two years in who hasn't gotten oh, it yet. No, someone who's like 10 years in and was like, oh, you're as good as you're going to get. That's it. And you're not good. And they like, in Long Island, some of those guys have like, they're bitter and angry, but about things that don't even make sense. Dude, those, I, went, I did with Dom once. Yeah. Governors. I went yeah. to visit him. I was doing something. I don't know what. But anyway, there's all these guys talking. Yeah. And they were like, what's the other one? Governors, brokerage, and what? McGuire's. McGuire's. Yeah. So one of those. Okay. And they were like, they all held on to this belief. Like, Louis C.K. came out here, and he said, if you can kill here, it's good stuff. Right. It's good. If you can kill here, it'll kill anywhere. And they kept holding on to that. Like, it's Yeah, canon. it's insane. Like, it means something. It's like where one, like, one state. You guys, with yeah. your fucking hats. You're not doing anything. No, you're not. Yeah, yeah. Louis said this is tougher maybe than a fucking yeah, whatever room. But right. Like, that, he just said it in passing. Yeah, and I'm sure he said a lot of other things you did chose not to listen to. Yeah. You know? That's like fat people being like, they said cheat day. Uh-huh. They said one day we ate whatever we wanted. Yeah. Like, a lot what of about the other six take days? Account, uh, muscle, uh, body, I mean, uh, bone mass. Well, those they're Long fat. Island guys get really mad. They get mad about gigs that didn't even make sense. They'd be like, you know, Tommy got that gig at Abandanzas. It's like... You're fighting over low-level yeah, shit. I'm sorry you didn't get the Christmas party at Ravioli's on Route 110. You fucking put a gun in your mouth, you know? It's like... It's, <laughs> it was like and they, a lot of them, like, the best case is, like, warm-up comic for a cooking show. Warm-up comic for... Oh, right. That's the best case. They're royalty. God. You know? And they get treated like they're doing it kind of guy. Well, they're making 200 grand a year, and it's like... Or 100 something grand a year, and it's like, yeah, I guess that, you know, what was the other... The other option for like the, that guy was never going to be Carlin. Right. He ever. wasn't going to be Pryor. Ever. The other option was fucking being a shitty salesman. Oh, man. What happened? I thought this was hash. Oh, I'm sorry. No, what was it? It's DMT. It's better than hash. DMT. Oh, my God. I can't believe. I hope uh, that's insane. Hell yes. DMT. I, I had this. Hell yes. Oh, my God. Hell yes. Have you done DMT? Once. Is it yeah. as is it as crazy as people say? I didn't quite get there. What I've okay. heard from a lot of people is that like you don't quite get there every time. Yeah, you get there once in a while. Right. But yeah, I mean, I've heard things. Yeah. Some stories like Shane Moss has stories about it, and like yeah, somebody like coming back in different DMT trips. Like, all right, thank you. Where you been? been yeah, waiting yeah, for yeah. you again. Or right. Like, this one guy was like, saw something in a DMT trip. He's like, you're gonna meet this dude, and then like. Three months later, not on a trip. He just met that dude. No way. He was like yeah. told about something that was going to happen, and then it just happened. Okay. But it wasn't like a premonition. Like they were like, "Hey, this you're going to meet this guy, and he's going to bring you this offer." Wow. And that's what happened. He's like, "What?" Yeah, I, I don't know. I got to do it more, and now I will. That's when I had a DMT trip. The guy's like, "You're going to meet an agent who's from Long Island." He's going to tell you he's from Long Island. And at that point, you know. That's like no respect. It's so base. No respect for you. Yeah. To be, instead of being like. So true. Hey, listen. Yeah. Tell me about your plans and what you're into. And I'm right. Gonna what I'm going to do. Right. I'm gonna see, we're both going to see if this will be a good match or not. Yeah. It's like you're going to. 
It's like, you go, oh, well, who'd you meet with? Like, I met with CAA. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, um, you know, they're Satanists. Anyway, so yeah. it's like, there's no, it's like the Chevy engine falling out. It's yeah, like, how dumb like, do you think I am? Is great, and they have Will Ferrell. Right. Do, but let's say they have Will Ferrell. Right. And they're devoted to guys like that. And right. you might be able to, like, sneak in on that. Yeah. Maybe. Right. That might be true, man. Right. But I tell you what I will do for you. Right. You know, I'll take your call every right. day. <laughs> right. Here's what I will do. Have you heard of bananas and Hesburgh? You know, and that's whatever. Like yeah. Realistic. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. But it's not the sad guy that wanted to be the empire builder, whether it's a comedian, whether it's a fucking salesman, the guy that should have punched a clock, the guy that that whole post-war economy of factories was was meant for that guy who never should have ever thought of doing anything independent that guy in an environment like sales or comedy failing miserably is one of the saddest things to see yeah. but also like, tragically one this? of the funniest why are you doing yeah, this why are you doing it and you know they're doing it because that fucking that it's like you know what they're doing it because they fucking saw somebody else do it. And they're like, I can do that. That's and they easy. go, I can do it too. And it sort of is easy. There's no training. There's no My training. friend told me this. There's some girl uh, doing stand-up and it was like bad. And then someone was like, uh, let me give you some advice. And then my buddy Kevin was like, just kind of give, but not like, uh-uh. I'm like what? He goes, some people, man, they're just not supposed to be doing this. Yeah. You don't have to help them. Yeah. They're not supposed to be in this. Yeah, they don't. You, if, you're you're yeah. helping them by letting them go away. If you need for me to explain to you yeah. why the Long Island laugh off comedy competition is not, like is not the, the end, end goal, goal. Yeah. maybe you should find something else to do yeah. what's that art that thing from caddyshack the world needs ditch diggers too and and by the way not that not doing comedy is ditch diggers it's probably there's a lot of people that probably have much happier lives not i mean there were guys yeah, like castro could have used someone to teach him how to throw a fastball right he didn't and guess what found there his fucking go. way he found his way he found what he wanted to do but like my, my manager in sales would say all the time he'd be like a lot of people are just meant to have a boss he's like not like me he's like i'm like a manager i just help you facilitate you he goes they're meant to have a guy that yells at them if they get in at 906 wow and that's he goes their- that's what they're about they need that he goes they need a guy and they need I by the way like that the one guy was in the army or maybe navy but like he was like yeah he, he likes being given tasks and completing those tasks and then asking for the next task yeah you know in in real business life i mean 100 you know? and that's what they and that's what a lot of people are built for a lot of people are just not built simply to be independent, be independent. that's not what they're about it's not who they are yeah i like it i like the chaos of it yeah it's i thrive in the chaos like, what am I gonna eat? who knows who am i gonna, what are we gonna figure out am i gonna go to a turkish bath and see a and there's lots of different ways right ways to do it Hundred percent. There is no one. There's only one right way to do it. There's one way to do it. But people, I guess some people are into that. You're right. The world does need dish diggers in the. Well, people people need some people just need that formula, and a lot of people just get happiness from their family and kids, where they're like that too. They're like, hey, I don't different, different styles of success, which is great. They're like, hey, I don't. And then you meet some people where you can tell their family is just like decorations. Mm -hmm. You know. You ever read the (laughs) Stranger? Nabokov. No, uh, Albert Camus. No. Similar, uh, whatever. Yeah. Just, but like, yeah. Uh, he, this guy who's stationed in Morocco. Yeah. And he liked hanging out by the beach and yeah. just smoking his cigarettes. And they gave him a, a transfer offer to Paris. Okay. That's like, yeah. that's what you want to get. That's the spot. Called up to the major. And he was like, ah, I kind of like smoking my cigarettes and staring at the beach. Yeah. I'm not going to be able to get that in Paris. And people are like, are you crazy? Right. It's Paris, man. Yeah. But it is this thing of like, I want something other than you want me to want. Yeah, and that's there's a beauty to that. There's a beauty to people that are like, "Hey, man, I'm not into that. I'm not into what the value system or whatever that you, you that you've bought into because we all buy into something. Mm-hmm. We buy into the idea that this is how we satiate our hunger. Like this is how you know. Yeah. Some people buy into the people go. I love heroin. They go. This is you know what I mean. I mean not to not to like. <laughs> You not to, like going to rock shows every every Friday yeah. and Saturday, and that's their thing. It's like great. They're, Some they're people really just cool. go like, "This is what this is what I'm about." You know, one, you know, my cousin terrified me. She's a drug addict, but she terrified. She had such a terrifying thing one day at a, t- at a table. We sat there, and she goes, "She's you know, Timmy. I know my family loves me. She goes, I love them. She goes, I love my friends. But she goes, I really love heroin. <sighs> and it was terrifying because it was like, oh God, wow. You know what I mean? She was honest. She was being so honest. And you ever, you ever with a person where they're being so honest that you don't even know what to do? Like she's like, I just love heroin. 
Yeah, you can't be like. She's like, oh, I can't not. tell you, I'm not going to do heroin. She, I, I can't. She goes, I can't she even. Loves she loves it. You ever done it? Never. But I bet. It? I. <laughs> what a great ending to the podcast. We just do heroin. <laughs> just go silent for 25 minutes. <laughs> but I mean, that's the type of thing where it's like, oh man, she just fucking. Can't this. argue with that. She knows what she wants. I love getting on stage and making a bunch of people laugh, and like she loves heroin, and you know what? Heroin, and they probably produce a similar feeling. Yeah, that 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 joy. Dude, and I, I bet they produce a similar feeling. God, heroin. I, just wanna, a, I just want to know what it feels like. What is that? I don't want to be a heroin addict. That John Prine song like. and the gold rolled through his veins like a thousand railroad trains and gave him all the confidence he lacked. What is that? John Prine, great folk singer. It was talking about Sam Stone came home to his wife and family after serving in the conflict overseas. And all the time he served had shattered all his nerves and left a little shrapnel in his knee. But the grass, but the morphine eased the pain, and the grass grew round his brain, and gave him uh, confidence in the hours that he chose. While the kids ran around wearing other people's clothes. I mean, that's a great song. And he, and, and the last couple of lines is like, and the, the, the the hook, which is the famous one, is there's a hole in Daddy's arm where all the money goes, and Jesus Christ died for nothing. I suppose. Wow. Great. Oh, John Prine, man, that's heavy. How, that's as he? close as I get to heroin. When was he? Uh, but he was around when Dylan was around i mean they were yeah. there were guys in the i mean john prine is as brilliant and as great a fucking guy as ever touched a guitar i mean and the and you know and and the gold rolled through his veins like a thousand railroad trains i mean just yeah you know, and he said he goes and the room smelled just like death uh when he popped his last balloon i forget the exact fucking uh wording but i mean that song sam that. stone download sam stone it's great i'll get that Hey, um, all right. <laughs> you got to promote. What do you, I was you a little heavy. It was a heavy end to it. Uh, no, it's all right. No, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> it makes me long for like to have been it. Yeah, it. dude. That's good. Like, man, that's the cool. real stuff, when man. You do go by CBGB's and see where for Lou Reed. Like, oh, oh, yeah. I, I stay in this neighborhood. You're like, oh, you would have hated what they did to it. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, my, I have a website, timdillancomedy.com. We have dates there all the time. Uh, I will. Updates. It's uh, your website. Yeah, which you makes sense. Company. I mean, I don't know what it comes out. I'm at Caroline's on. Uh, okay, Caroline's on New Year's Eve. If you want to come by that, that should be a lot of fun. Uh, oh, and uh, with with uh, a couple of guys, Noah Garden Schwartz and Doug Smith is a good. It's a really good uh, mm -hmm. New Year's show at uh, Caroline's. And you can follow me on Twitter, Tim J Dillon. I have a podcast called Tim Dillon is going to hell. Tim Dillon is going to hell. Yeah, it's you all know, about it's my obsession with the rich and the evil and all that. So with all those like, with all those horrible people. people. Well, it's not only satanic, it's, you know, we do, we do, uh, we had a whole episode on Lou Pearlman, that the fat uh, pedophile Ponzi scheme guy who, you know. Yeah, we're getting to that Hollywood stuff with like the, the young guys. No, no, I want, a, I want a job. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. You've heard those stories though, right? Where no, what story? Yeah, of course. Like, yeah, you yeah, be a star? I will make you a star. Of course, yeah. It's a hot tub you got to get into. But those are, you know, Ari, those are unconfirmed. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, who can say? Mike, Mike. Uh, who Lawrence can really about, say? What's his name when he went on uh, the Good Morning America and sang all yeah. weird? What's Corey like, Feldman. Yeah. And Mike, everyone's like talking about it. Mike Lawrence like, yeah, who would have thought that the guy who got molested and yeah.